Hi there, I'm Miranda Luna and I'm the product manager for Windows Azure Mobile Services. Mobile Services makes it quick and easy to build dynamic and engaging mobile apps at scale. So what we do is we provide you with a little bit of structured storage through SQL Database, an easy way to authenticate users via Facebook, Twitter, any sort of third-party identity provider you might be interested in, as well as send push notifications. We've always had support for window, building Windows Store and Windows Phone apps in C Sharp. Today, I'm really excited to tell you about how we've made it even easier to uh, design those connected mobile applications right from within Visual Studio. So today, I'm going to walk you through connecting a new, uh, brand new Windows Store project in Visual Studio to a backend hosted in Windows Azure and show you how easy it is to add push notifications and get up and running with data and uh, a little bit of custom code through scripts. So let's get going. So we're just going to start by making a new project in Visual Studio to show you exactly what you can do now from within the Visual Studio experience. What's really great about uh, this integration is that a lot of the work you used to have to do in the portal, like writing, uh, writing and editing your scripts, uh, working with data, you can now do right from within Visual Studio IDE. So we're going to go to Visual C Sharp, new Windows Store app, and let's call this um, Cloud VS. Now, what, while that's being created, this isn't actually connected to Windows Azure yet. What we're going to do as soon as this is created is we're going to go over to our Server Explorer. You'll see that right here we just have the generic app template that comes with Visual Studio. It's a generic Windows Store template. If I hit F5, you're going to see the same experience you would with any other net new project, right? So it's completely blank, ready for you to work with it. So I'm going to quickly go back here. IntelliTrace is on great. Let's shift F5. Stop running that. And then we're going to go over here. And we are going to add connected service. This is what's going to connect it to Windows Azure with that SQL database in the cloud and also with those scripts um, and open up user authentication and push notifications. So if this was the first time I was doing this, as you might be able to tell, it's not my first rodeo, I would go to Import Subscriptions, and I'd have to browse to find uh, my Windows Azure profile. If I was doing this for the first time, I'd have to go to Download Subscription File, and it would take me here to the Windows Azure portal, which is where I'd be able to get, um, get that for my account. So if you have multiple subscriptions, you can definitely upload different subscription files. But today, since I'm just going to be using the one I already have here, I'm not going to go through all this again. So this is, this is showing you my uh, Windows Azure MSDN Visual Studio Ultimate subscription. These are mobile services I already have running today. As you can see, I was hanging out at TwilioCon recently. So this is the, the mobile services subscription I want to use, so I'm going to hit OK. And we boogie over here to the Server Explorer. It cooperates. Now we're going to see that under my mobile services, what the heck? So I, I skipped an important step after I was explaining how to do all the import subscription work. I need to create new service if I don't want to connect to an existing one. The great thing is with Visual Studio and Windows Azure is we obviously give you a lot of different options. So you can connect an existing app to a new mobile service. You can uh, you know, create a new mobile service and application at the same time. But today, since I started with a net new app that's not connected, I'm going to create a new service and map it to this. So I'm going to use the same name. Cloud VS. Hopefully, no one's taking it. And you'll see that it's cloudvs.azuremobile.net. Um, mobile services is just a Node.js app that runs on top of Windows Azure websites and kind of makes it a lot easier to hit the certain mobile scenarios we've discussed so far. We're in West US. Uh, I already have a database over here. I'm going to use this one. Um, enter my password so that I'm not creating too many new things. If you wanted to create a new database or you know, provision a new server, you could do all that right from within Visual Studio as long as you have network connectivity. Um, and that's going to take a minute or so. Since we are creating a new mobile service, the great thing is that this is going to take no longer than it would if I was right in the Windows Azure portal and going through the new compute mobile services experience, which you might have seen in some other videos. So we're going to give this just a second to finish up. Great. So now what you can see here is that I've created that new service right from within Visual Studio. And if I went to the Windows Azure portal, which I might as well do just to show you, but if I go here back to where all my mobile services are, you'll see that if I 
refresh everything. Let me just refresh here very quickly. You will see that new Cloud VS mobile service exists here, which is great. I didn't go to the portal. I didn't go through the create net new. Um, from within Windows Azure, I didn't use the command line. I did it all from Visual Studio, and there's Cloud VS up and ready to go. Of course, we could have just trusted it from Visual Studio, but I like to prove that this is all live. All right, so Cloud VS, that's the mobile service we're going to use. And this is just connecting the mobile service to the app that we already have provisioned. So the first step was creating the mobile service. Now they have to uh, run that connection. And you'll see right here that what it actually did was show your uh, mobile services key. And then also that same URL I showed you, cloudvs.azuremobile.net. And that's what's going to mean that every time I you know, import some new data, every time I write, run a new script, um, it's going to all be show, it's all going to get pushed right back up into the Windows Azure Cloud. Uh, another really cool thing I can do is if I want to send push notifications, all I do is come in here and say add push notification. And I'm going to just follow this little wizard to, pr uh, and it's basically going to associate this application, which I already have uh, net new project in Visual Studio with the mobile services backend, and it's going to acquire a channel URI and then connect it so that the push notification settings are already configured for you, uh, given your Windows Store developer account. So this is just going to prompt me to sign into the Windows Store. If anyone's looking to spam me, you are welcome to right there. And it's going to send me a text message just to verify that it is in fact me who's creating this application in Visual Studio. I just received it, so I'm going to go ahead and enter it. And you know, there's really nothing you can do with this passcode because it'll prompt me to create a new one if I need to again. So as you can see, all the applications have already set up with the WNS service, which is what Windows Store apps use for push notifications, are right here. If I wanted to reserve a new app name that's associated explicitly with this new service, I could. So I could call this Cloud VS, and as long as it's available, I can even reserve with WNS right from within Visual Studio, which is fantastic, and it's already configured. So I have that selected. I'm going to hit Next. Do, 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 do. And as you can see, I have that option to import subscriptions again, because if I didn't want to just go through the Add Connected Service flow, and I really just wanted to go straight to push notifications, maybe I didn't want to use the SQL database, maybe I didn't care about user authentication, maybe I, I'm not that interested in the scripts, I could go through that same flow I showed you with the provisioning your profile and importing subscriptions right through this Add Push Notification flow. But since I've already done that, I'm just going to go Cloud VS, and I'm going to finish. So as you can see, what's going on here is we're simply adding a reference to the mobile services SDK, bringing in the co code files necessary to initialize the logic, which, you know, that custom logic is contained in mobile services script files. You know, as you can see right here, we opened right up into an insert, um, an insert script. So what that means is anytime I make an insert on a SQL database, which is associated with my mobile service, there's going to be uh, whatever code I put here is going to execute. So what I'd like to show you today is to leave this start from scratch app here and pull open uh, a mobile services, just the starter project that you get with mobile services. It's a to-do app. So I'm just going to quickly open that up. Um, the reason I'm going to use this is because I don't want to uh, start a new project and write a to-do app right now. We're trying to keep these videos digestible. So as soon as this opens, I'm going to hit F5, show you what it looks like. And since uh, this is an app I actually grabbed from the portal, I, it's already connected to a mobile service called Twilio, TwilioCon 2K13. So now I've opened my TwilioCon 2K, um, 2K13 app right here in Visual Studio. You know, if I open my app.xaml file, you'll see this is where I have that connection to mobile services. Uh, this app is going to have a different URL than obviously Cloud VS that we created live today, and the connection string is already going to be pre provisioned. So what I'm going to do is F5 and just show you what this looks like. So as you can see when I start the app, if I add a to-do item like head to building 127 where I'm recording this today and hit save, what it's going to do is send a post right to my Windows Azure SQL database and this is going to be stored in there. And the way we have it provisioned right now, um, that there's a field for text and then there's a boolean for completed or not and that's going to be false right now. If I hit this button, it's going to be true. So what I'm going to show you is just how cool it is that you can edit the data, um, edit the scripts that run on the CRUD operations on a SQL database right from within Visual Studio. So if I go over to my Server Explorer, you'll see that 
my Windows Azure Mobile Service is right here. And the SQL database I associated with it is right there as well. So I'm using TwilioCon 2K13. And there's going to be a database associated with that too. So this is that table that we're working with, to-do item, and I asked it to refresh. But if you go right here and to, let me just show you the Windows Azure portal really quick so you know that I'm not lying, that we just added that uh, data. So we go to to-do item to that table we created right from within uh, Visual Studio, right there, head to building 127, uh, complete, the Boolean is set to false. So what we're going to do is on the insert script, we're just going to add a really short line of code, and what it's going to do is add a timestamp every time we add a new to-do item. And it's going to do that using dynamic schema, which is a feature in mobile services that you're welcome to leave on during development so that you can uh, create a schema for your database dynamically, you don't have to you know, set uh, explicitly set anything. Uh, and then once you go to production, you can just flip it off. So let's go over here to the insert script. OK, so on insert, I'm going to say uh, new or item.created equals new date. And this is all in JavaScript, even though you're within Visual Studio. Uh, currently, mobile services only supports JavaScript on the server, but we will be adding support for C Sharp soon. And then that experience will be baked right into Visual Studio as well. So if I save this, and now I hit F5, say new to-do item, let's say um, grab lunch at the Commons. I'm giving you guys the tour of the Redmond campus today. You'll see head to building 127 is still there. Now I've added grab lunch at the Commons with a little post. I'm going to mark that as completed so that when we go back over to the Windows Azure portal, you'll see what it, exactly we just did from within Visual Studio. So let's stop this really quickly. Head over to Windows Azure portal. And if I refresh this, what's going to be really cool is from right within uh, Visual Studio, not only did we add a new column called created, and that's where that um, item.created equals new date came in. It just put a little timestamp in UTC time. But we also went ahead and marked uh, head to building 127 in the complete column as true, and that updated right there, all from within um, our experience in Visual Studio. Now, you can you know, completely edit and debug scripts from within Visual Studio. You can't actually browse the data. You do need to head to the Windows Azure portal for that. Uh, but pretty much anything else you can do from within Visual Studio, including opening up the Windows Azure portal, you know, adding those uh, profiles that we talked about, and making sure that all your projects align to the right subscription. So it's pretty cool. We're really excited about it, and we're really, really excited to continue to improve the experience for Visual Studio developers using Windows Azure to build connected applications. I hope that you found that useful, and now you're off and running building connected mobile applications using Visual Studio and Windows Azure. If you're looking for more information, head to www.windowsazure.com mobile, and you'll find everything you need. Thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Donna Malieri. I'm a program manager on the Azure App Service team. And today I'm going to talk to you about how you can build great cross-platform, enterprise-grade mobile apps using Azure App Service. In particular, I'm going to show you how you can make your app both responsive and resilient to network connectivity problems by using a feature called Offline Sync. So let's get started. First off, let me talk about Azure. Now, a lot of people, when they see this slide, they get a little nervous because they think they need to know everything that's here. And the fact of the matter is you don't. New services come out constantly. And I can tell you that even members of the Azure team have a hard time keeping track of what's new. The, the cool thing is that most of these services work independently of one another, even though they do provide additional benefits when they integrate. So if you take a look at this chart and you see one or two services that you might be interested in, you can learn more. And don't feel like you need to understand everything before you can start getting, uh, making use of Azure for your application. And basically, you know, use what you need, and you only need to learn what you need to use. Today I'm going to talk about the so-called app platform within App Service, which includes web apps, API apps, mobile apps, API management and notification hubs. In particular, I'm going to show you an app that has both a web client and a mobile client. And it also has a web job that it uses to do background tasks. So let's get started by taking a look at the capabilities that you get with App Service mobile apps. 
So this chart might be familiar to you if you're familiar with mobile services. In fact, we have the same sections on the right. You have your data connections. We've added some new ones. We have on-premise data connections now, uh, including connectors with Salesforce and Dynamics. And uh, we have a DocDB access, for instance. Authentication is handled the same as usual and push notifications as well. A new feature that we've had relatively recently is offline sync. And the way that works is that you can sync whatever data source it is that you've configured for your mobile backend to your mobile client. And we have data sync available for all of our client platforms uh, with the exception of Cordova, which we're working on. So essentially, your client can abstract away knowledge of the underlying data source. So you could write your app connecting to a SQL server, for instance, and then later change it to connect to Salesforce without ever, ever changing any of your mobile client code. Now, a change that we made recently within the last year when we introduced App Service Mobile is to change the underlying compute that you use for your mobile backend. What we heard from customers was that they liked the flexibility that they got with mobile services, but they wanted more control over the compute container. We tried to make things easier by abstracting that away, but customers said, no, I actually, I actually want to be able to manage all of this. So now, with App Service Mobile, your backend is just a regular Azure web app, which was formerly known as an Azure website. So that means all of these great features that web apps has had for years and is continuing to innovate on are available to all mobile backends. So that includes things like Traffic Manager, VNet, App Service Environments, and continuous integration and deployment. So I'm going to give you a couple of customer examples of some really cool apps that people have built that really unleash the power of Azure Mobile and make it so that they can focus on their app code rather than focusing on their infrastructure. So if you've ever traveled with Alaska Airlines, you may have used their mobile app. Now, they also have a huge number of employee apps. One such app is Hopper, which is how employees of Alaska, including flight attendants who need to travel for work, uh, how they actually find spare seats on flights, and they can go from one destination to another. And uh, they need their own system because they're not obviously paying for a ticket, and they need to see what flights are available. And they had an app for this before, but it used uh, just regular classic ASP. It was not a responsive app. It didn't work uh, offline. It didn't work on a mobile device. And it also had a lot of missing functionality. So a group of passionate engineers at Alaska said, hey, I bet you we could rewrite this and make it way better. And if we use Azure, that'll really boost our productivity. And so that's just what they did. They built this great Xamarin app that has fantastic internal reviews. And they use Azure Mobile and including notification hubs and connecting onto an on-premise data source in order to deploy this app. And they really have a lot of great things to say. If you want to learn more about this, check out the videos from last year's AzureCon, where they actually have some videos showing how they built this app. Now, you can also uh, have consumer apps. That, there are a lot of great ones that run on App Service. One example is the uh, NASCAR uh, results app that has a uh, tablet version and a mobile version. And this app is interesting because it uses a lot of different Azure services, such as uh, our new Relic integration, which is available through the Azure Store. And of course, Xamarin, which is very popular for mobile apps. And I'll show you a demo with Xamarin in just a moment. They use Redis, Microsoft SQL, and MySQL. And their website actually used PHP, which shows that Azure supports more than just .NET. Now, one more employee app, since that's the more common em employee enterprise scenario that we're seeing lately, and that is the Transport, Transport for London fault reporting app. Transport for London is an organization that manages all of the transit in London. So if you've ever visited London, you've taken one of their services. Now, with a city that large, 
there's going to be issues that arise. There could be potholes, there could be some uh, power line that's, that's causing a problem for a bus, uh, that kind of thing. And in the past, employees had to either you know, track things down on paper and then enter them into a computer later or carry around a heavy laptop to record these issues because the issues need to eventually go on to some on-premise system. So what they've done is they've written an iOS native app that works offline that allows employees to take photos of issues and this gets submitted back to an on-premise system. So in the case of Transport for London, they didn't want to move all of their existing infrastructure to Azure, but they did want to take advantage of these great offerings that we can give them, particularly in the case of mobile development. So they're using app service environments and VNets in order to securely connect back to their on-premise system. And these are just some of the examples. If you go to azure.com, you'll see that there's even more examples, including the very popular jet.com, who are hosting their mobile site on uh, app service. So the, the key thing to summarize that Azure App Service gives you is a fully managed platform. It really delivers on the promise of PaaS that we heard you know, when the cloud came out, but it's taken time for these services to mature and over the past several years, Azure App Service has really come into its own as a fully managed platform. The other great thing about it is you don't have to rewrite your code in order to run an app service. You just write your code the way you normally would, you know, a PHP site or an ASP.NET app, and you deploy it. You don't have to use a custom programming model. At the same time, you get all these great DevOps features like continuous integration and deployment, load testing, and you also get these enterprise features like VNet integration, Azure Active Directory integration, and so forth. So, you know, developers like writing code, but most developers don't want to focus on infrastructure and servers. They want to focus on application code. And app servers really frees you up to be able to focus on your app and why, what it does that's special, not a lot of boilerplate. So, let me show you a demo of a really simple app that has both a web client and a mobile client that we've built with Azure App Service. So let me switch now to Visual Studio. And here you can see that I have a Xamarin Forms app. It has targets for Windows Phone, Android, and iOS. And I'll be demoing the iOS version of this app. So let's show, let me show you the mobile version of this app. This is a really, really simple version of, uh, say, Instagram. Um, like, really, really bare bones. Doesn't have filters, doesn't have tagging, but allows users to share photos. You can use social authentication or Facebook authentication. And you can upload images that are either shared or private to a user. So if we go to the web client, we can see some of these images that we've already uploaded. Now on the right, you can see there are some links to load different size images. And the way that that works is that when you upload an image from either the web or the mobile client, we have a web job that runs in the background that looks for a message that's posted to a queue. And when it sees that message, it loads up the blob and it does an image resizing algorithm in the background. And you can run this web job either on the same site that you're ho using to host your web and mobile backend or on its own site. And I'm not going to show you the code for this web job, but this entire project is open source and available in the Azure Samples repository. So now let's look at the mobile version of this. So now in this case, I'm logged in using Facebook. And so I see, in addition to the default album, I see a new album called Cat Photos, which I don't have added anything to yet. So let me do that here. This is my cat. Um, and it's taking a little while because it's uploading this image. And now it's uploaded. Now, if I click on these buttons, you can see that the image size is not available yet for the different sizes. The reason is that we are not synchronously resizing this image. Otherwise, that would make the mobile client wait, which would be kind of silly. Instead, 
uh, when the image is uploaded, the client sends a message to an API, and then uh, an item is added to an Azure queue, which the web job then listens for. Now, I talked about offline sync being a very important piece of functionality, particularly because you don't necessarily always have network access, or sometimes maybe you just want to limit the amount of data you use. And at the very least, you want an app that's very responsive. So as soon as it starts up, it should load the data that it loaded previously and not make the user wait. So let us simulate an offline scenario. In fact, let's completely take off the network. And so this means the simulator also has no network. And if we try to sync here, what we're going to see is it can't work your, you know, it can't sync your offline. So, however, we know we've just taken this really awesome cat photo. And so it's critical that we upload it as soon as we can. So again, it's showing a message because this app assumes that you're online. It's just saying, hey, just so you know, you don't have, you haven't uploaded this image. And this image doesn't show up here because uh, it is always using what's actually been uploaded to the server. But the image is still loaded into the app. So all I have to do is turn the Wi-Fi back on and pull down to refresh. I can do that from either the main view or the cat photos view. Now we can see that the cat photo is indeed uploaded. And if we were to do the same thing, but add to the default album, let's do uh, this photo instead, uh, we would see the same thing. So let me turn the Wi-Fi back on and sync it again. And now the image is loaded up. And let me go to my web client, because I have to go to the default album. Let's refresh this page. And we will see, and here I'm not going to bother signing in. So here we will see this new image. Here we are. Now, uh, the image resizing has kicked in, and uh, the web job has run and resized the image. Let me show you the code briefly for this to show you how easy it is to set up both offline sync and this new feature of uploading images uh, in and any kind of blob data, actually, even when the user is offline. So first, what you need to do is have a mobile service client. You use our mobile client SDK. Here I'm using the one for Xamarin, but we have it for Android and iOS. Uh, as well as Cordova. And we create a SQLite store, which is how we're going to actually store the structured data, not the image data, but just the structured data. And then we create some local tables. Then we create uh, sync contacts, which is essentially tracking all of these changes that we made while we were offline. And the other thing that we're going to do is uh, set up the local store so that we get callbacks whenever there are local or server operations. And this is a new feature that we've added with our file sync support. And it means that you can either write your own code that synchronizes in the background and refreshes the UI by listening for these callbacks. Or in the case of the file sync API, this is how it actually finds out that there are new records. And then it makes queries to the server to find out what images are associated with them. In order to actually sync, it's super easy. You just push both the file changes and the regular changes and pull the albums that you want. Uh, in addition, when you're using file sync, you're going to want to write a file sync handler, which again is also really simple. Uh, you set a file data source. In this case, I'm using the dependency service pattern in Xamarin. And so I have a simple class that just loads uh, different different classes to actually load the image from the device, since that is platform specific. And then a file synchronization uh, action is going to get triggered whenever there is a change to a file. So that's how that listener, that's why that listener is being used. It gets this, it triggers this callback. So here, if you are, in the case of delete, we're going to delete the file. Otherwise, we're going to uh, download the file. And that's how it works. And the key there that I showed you was offline sync. And the reason is that nowadays you can't always assume 
network connectivity, and users are expecting more from their apps. Even if they aren't some app that's critical to work functionality, people want to be able to use them and sync data later. The problem is that most apps, the reason that most apps don't have offline sync is that it's usually really hard to get this functionality to work. It's relatively easy if you only want read-only data, but as soon as you start changing data, and the data can be changed by multiple people or even just multiple devices, then the problem of doing sync becomes really hard. And so in the spirit of app service, in order to let you focus on your app code and not boilerplate and infrastructure, we have these client SDKs and server SDKs to make this super easy. So the reasons for doing offline sync are basically what I said. Um, you know, it could be just as simple as making your app responsive, or it could be the most interesting case where you have multiple users editing the same data, but you want to make sure that they don't stomp over each other's changes. So we also include conflict handling. So the way it works is that the client SDK, the offline sync feature of it, keeps track of all the changes that are being made when the app is offline, and it saves these to a queue. And then when the app detects that it has network access again, uh, in the case of the app I was showing, it always checks for network access. And so the sync action is triggered by the user actually pulling down to refresh. Uh, at that point, the app calls the push and pull methods. And what push does is it finds all these changes that were in the sync context, and it sends them one by one to the server, ensuring that the operation is preserved. Uh, you can also use this feature in conjunction with Azure notification hubs and have your server actually send silent or raw push notifications to the client so that the client wakes up and then downloads data. And you can even do this in a background task so that the app always has the freshest data. So to summarize, what App Service does is that it provides the infrastructure so that you can run your mission critical or even not so mission critical web and mobile apps. You can have these apps scale with your business. You can start out small with the free tier and scale all the way up to hundreds of instances that run in an app service environment. So let us do the infrastructure, and you can write your app. Thank you very much. OK. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thanks for coming to the session. So uh, how many of you are mobile app developers or publishers of mobile apps? OK. So you make all the effort to create a mobile app with a good idea. You go and publish that app. If it's a consumer app, maybe to the store. Or if it's an enterprise app, maybe just uh, exposed to the employees. Now think of the moment when your users are downloading the app. How sure are you about how long are they going to use the app? So this is what we are going to talk about with Azure Mobile Engagement. So you can participate in the demo by downloading the apps. And we'll talk about it more in the next few slides. So what is user engagement? Now, here are some hard facts for you. 69% of the users open an app less than 10 times. Now think of it. You have done all your effort in creating this wonderful app, and users are not even using it. 25% of the users use an app just once. And these are some industry studies which show it, but think of the moment when you have downloaded an app from the store. Like, how long do you typically use it? And most of the users, they just use less than five apps. And most of them are social media, email, and that's it. So what do you do? So the answer is push notifications. Just to be clear, so we have a couple of types of push notifications with mobile apps. So you have system or what we call as out of app notifications, which show up in the notification center. And then you have these in-app push notifications, which show up within the app. And both have their own scenarios. The system or out of app notification is intended for the users when they are not in the app, so just to encourage them to get back in the app. And then with in-app push notifications, you can get much more creative with what you are pushing to those app users. 
So push notifications, why are they effective? Again, 90% of the push notifications are read within 15 minutes after reception. So that means that the users are clicking on the notifications are getting and getting back into your app. Push notifications are 10 times more effective than marketing emails. So if you have published an app and if you're sending an email to the users to get back into the, into the app, then you can forget about that. And then apps using notifications double their retention rate. And the reason being that if you have published an app and if you're not doing smart notifications, then the users have likely forgotten about your app. You have to do notifications. But the world has now moved from doing the mass notifications, which come across as spam to your users, which will likely lead to the unintended effect of the users just uninstalling your app. The idea is to move to a much more targeted and personalized notifications. Now, many of you have come here from different parts of the world to San Francisco, taking flights. I had an airline app, and I noticed how it was sending me some smart notifications and continuously engaging me as I was coming here, like telling me that, OK, hey, your flight was delayed. Your gate has changed. So this is an intelligent mechanism in which the app or the brand is telling me, communicating with me, providing me useful information, and which is not spam to me. It is useful for me. So it increases that brand attached between me and the app that I have downloaded. So that is what the world is all about. You have to be in a position to send intelligent, smart, and contextual messages to your, to your app users to encourage them that they come back into your app. So this is where I would like to introduce Azure Mobile Engagement. So Azure Mobile Engagement, it's a SaaS-delivered platform that enables app user analytics. Now, if you have to do smart contextual notifications to your app users, you have to understand their behavior. What are they doing in your app? How often are they opening your app? How much time are they spending in your app? What screens are they going? What are they eventually doing? For that, we have SDKs. And we have SDKs for all the platforms. So we have iOS, Android, uh, Windows, uh, Universal. And then we have Xamarin, Cordova, and even Unity now. So you embed those SDKs in your app, and we collect user analytics. What do you do with user analytics? Mobile engagement is not an, an, not an analytics product. It's a user engagement product. The analytics that you are collecting, we allow you to do something. And what you do is you can create fine-grained user segmentation with that collected data. So you can say that, give me a segment of my users who have not opened this app in the last 15 days. And OK, you have created that segment. And then we allow you to use this segment to send very smart notifications. So for, like in this example, for suppose if it's an e-commerce application, you can send some kind of a coupon to encourage the users to visit your app. You can find out that how many of my users put an items in the card, but they didn't eventually make the purchase. So you can send them some kind of a reminder to make that purchase, to complete that purchase. So it's all about increasing the usage of your app, making sure that the users who have downloaded that app, they continue to find value with your app. And if you have some kind of a monetization model attached with the app, it could be an ad-based, it could be a subscription-based. It allows, encourages the app users to get back into the app and then do certain actions, which eventually lead you to monetize effectively with your app. So enough of the slides. We'll quickly get back into a demo. So again, uh, we have this app, both iPhone and Android, and soon Windows app will be available. You can download it and play with it. So let me open what we have here. So I'm going to show this demo on my Android app. and. The app is attached to just opening the app here. If the Wi-Fi works. All right. 
So I get back into the app here. OK. So now we have the app, which is this Azure Mobile Engagement app. Oops. OK, so this is the app that I was talking about. And this is an app that we are going to release in the app stores, which allow you to understand what mobile engagement is and also understand how to uh, smartly send contextual notifications. And the source code will be available on GitHub. So uh, on to the right side, you see this is our SaaS portal, which allows you to get uh, all the information about your apps. So uh, here is an app, Android app. We have the Android SDK embedded. And you are able to collect all the data. So our SaaS portal is broken down into four major segments. So first of all, you have the Monitor tab. So I'm on the Monitor tab. And you can actually see we have three sessions live being recorded here. You can also uh, track events. So I have to log back in. Let's log back in uh, to my Android app, which is this one. So like I was saying, you can also track events. And these are some of the events which have just happened. So if I go in my app, and if I go to the Twitter page for my app, then you will see that Suddenly, you will see that we have this uh, menu clicked Twitter showing up on the Monitor tab. So Monitor is all about real-time collection. Then we have Analytics. So with Analytics, you get all the information about how many users you have, how many uh, sessions which are being happening. You can also get some rich visualization about your users. So you get to see that, OK, these many users started using the app at a certain point, and how many of these users are still using my app. So all of this is good information. We also allow you to uh, instrument the screens of your app. So here is the user path. So it basically is showing you how my app users are going in my app. So if you have like a very cool feature, and you want all of your users to use it, but with this data, you can see, if you see, that there is a very small circle representing that screen, then that tells you immediately that my app users are not even looking at that. So you need to fix that. So it's all about action, taking action with this analytics data. And again, we have uh, events, jobs. We also collect technical information. So uh, this is just because the SDK is embedded. So we collect information about uh, what was the device, uh, what was the screen size, whether the app was being accessed over Wi-Fi or a wired network, et cetera. So this is all good. But what can I do with it? So this is where we come to the last two, uh, the segments and the reach modules of the app. So here I have a segment called inactive users. And uh, what inactive users mean, it could mean differently for different people. But of all the data that you have collected, you can easily create rules to define one in what ineffective mean. We allow collecting data. And we also allow creating segment based on any of the data. So you can create a segment based on an event. So an event could be that, OK, uh, the user, so suppose it was a gaming app, you can say that the user is stuck on level two for a very long time. Or uh, if, it's a, if it's an activity, so an activity is a screen. So you can say that I want to get a segment of all my users who are going to this uh, checkout screen, but they are not making any purchase. So there is something wrong there. So once you have created these smart segments, that's when we can do a reach. So Reach is all about sending smart, personalized notifications to your app users. So here I have a few samples. And if I am getting back into the app, let's get back in the app. Uh, so I'm in the app. And this is our UI for sending notifications. So this UI is optimized for any user. They don't need to have any coding knowledge. There are no APIs and all. It's full visualized. It. Uh, you can use the UI to send the notifications. So I'll just clone this. And 
And you can see that, so first of all, we have the delivery type. You can set it could be an out of app or it could be an in-app notification. Uh, you can set different parameters, provide the title and the message. Now, this is a web announcement. A web announcement means that you can send very rich HTML content payload from your backend to the device. And again, like there are no APIs that you have to deal with. You can provide the entire content here. And we will see how the notification will look like on the device. And this is where you specify the criterion, the audience. You can either use any of the segment that you have created on that other tab. Or you can also uh, look through any of the other details which are already available. Because the SDK was there, it was collecting all of this data. So for this uh, demo, I'll just send a test notification and uh, look in the, uh, on the left side. So if, you, if I, I just send the test notification, and there. So the notification appears there, deal of the day. And when I click on this, this is when it will show up the rich HTML that was sent from the server side. So it's very easy. You can configure your sending the notifications uh, from your backend to your mobile app very easily. So the next demo that I have, a quick one, uh, is we also support what we call as data push. Now, a data push is a silent push. A silent push is useful in some scenarios where you don't want any pop-up or any kind of a notification to the users. The scenario that I have here is, uh, let me just close this one. And I'll go to the data push. So the scenario I have here is I am a very valuable user for the company, AdventureWorks. And the moment I come here, because of my, say, golden status, I get pushed an additional 15% discount. Now, this can be easily pushed through this data push. Now, uh, see the price is listed as 899 there. And I'll just uh, clone this. And I can send any content here. The idea behind sending this JSON content is that in the app, I can act on this and change the UI behavior based on this. So here I am passing discount rate in percent 100. Maybe I am very lucky. I'm getting 100% discount. And so I just send a test. And you will see that there the price changed to 0. And that was because in my SDK, I captured that JSON, and I used that data to change, switch out the pricing. And lastly, we also support something called polls. Now, poll is a quick survey. Again, it's a type of an in-app notification, a specialized in-app notification that you can send from the campaign manager or from, our, uh, from the UI. And let's see. So this is what we have. So I'm going to clone this one. And so this one, I'll send it as a system notification. So system notification is the one which will show up in the notification center for the Android app. And when the user clicks on that notification, they can get some quick survey. So this is like a couple of questions I have added with a few answers. And uh, this is like fully customizable. You can add any questions or uh, like it's, it's just uh, you can just do whatever uh, you want to send. And audience we talked about uh, for all the Notifications, you can also set certain time frame, like when do you want to start the campaign, when do you want to stop the campaign, because the deal could only be applicable for maybe a few uh, days or a few months. Even the survey, there might be like some kind of an end date associated with, with that survey. So uh, here, uh, I'm going to send this notification. And so since this was an, in, uh, uh, an out of app notification, uh, if I show this, so this is the product feedback, the first notification. So I click on this. And this is the, uh, the poll, the survey, the quick survey that I just sent out. And since I had Azure Mobile's engagement selected as the default, it is already selected here. So like this, uh, on the right side, if you see. So here I can uh, uh, select and submit. 
the good thing is, for all the notifications that we sent out, we are able to collect uh, analytics data about how many users acted on that notification. So you get a full view of the I sent x number of notifications, y number of notifications were captured by the users, and z number of notifications were actually where the users interacted or clicked on the notification. So that pipeline tells you that how effective are the notifications that I sent out. It tells you that whether the notifications that I'm sending, are they really useful, or are they just coming across as spam to the app users? And yeah, so that's pretty much the demo part. Uh, my last slide is about quick resources that we have available. So we have a booth here, Azure Mobile Engagement booth. So please come there uh, for any questions. And this is a live public service. Uh, you can go to Azure Mobile Engagement. Just search for Azure Mobile Engagement, and you can get all the detailed documentation, including tutorials for all our supported platforms. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marwan Hade, Program Manager on the Windows Azure Tools Team in Visual Studio. In this video, we'll show you the integration of Windows Azure Mobile Services in Visual Studio 2013. Windows Azure Mobile Services provides an easy-to-use backend, allowing mobile developers to store data in the cloud, easily authenticate users, and send push notifications. In Visual Studio 2013, we've made it very easy for you to leverage the storage and push capabilities of mobile services to build a connected Windows Store application. Let's take a look. The first thing I want to do is I want to associate my Windows Store application with a mobile service. I can do that using the Connected Services Manager. To start the Connected Services Manager, I simply select my project, go to Add, and choose the Connected Service command. The idea behind the Services Manager is that it's essentially the Enhanced References Manager. So not only can you add references to assemblies, but in addition, you can also insert proxy code to a particular service so that the moment you're done with the Services Manager, you can start writing code. At the moment, we've got two services, Windows Azure Mobile Services as well as Microsoft Ads. But as our platform continues to evolve, we'll be adding more online services. The first step, I need to import my subscriptions. I can simply go to the Windows Azure Management Portal, download a subscription file, save it to somewhere on the file system, browse to that location, and then import it into Visual Studio. Next, I can choose from either an existing list of services or create a new service. To create a new service, I simply choose a subscription, enter in a name, select from a list of regions, and then choose from a database. I can choose to create either a free SQL database, or if you, have an, if you want to start with a paid one, you can create a build SQL database. I then proceed to enter in a username and password. I'm going to use an existing service. Two things happen. The Connected Services Manager added references to various Windows Azure assemblies. And if I go to my app.xaml.cs file, I see that a new mobile service client object was added. Now, this client object was initialized with both the application URL as well as the application key, two things that are essential for my application, my Windows Store application, to communicate to my mobile service. So now that I've set up a connection between my application and my mobile service, I want to create a table so that I can store content. Now, I can do that very easily using the Server Explorer. So I go to the Windows Azure node, I expand it, I'll go to the Mobile Services node, expand it, and then I'll choose my mobile service, Canada Tracker 12. I can simply right-click and choose the Create Table command. I can then enter in a name. In addition, I can also configure permissions for this mobile service table. Each mobile service table has four scripts associated with it. These scripts are basically correlated to the four CRUD operations. So you've got an insert.js script, a delete.js script, a read.js script, and finally, an update.js script. In Visual Studio, you can open each script, edit it, and push contents back. Now that you've set up your table, you're ready to start writing code. 
in addition to writing code, in addition to, in addition to being able to store contents uh, onto a mobile service table, you also want to add push notifications. So being able to store contents in the cloud is great, but you can truly leverage the power of mobile services when you send push notifications. To help you send push notifications, we've added the push notification wizard. To start the push notification wizard, select your project, right click, and hit add push notification. In order to send push notifications, we're using the Windows notification service. In a nutshell, your client project obtains a Windows notification service channel and pushes it to a mobile service table. The mobile service table then pushes content down this channel. In order to receive a channel and send info on it, both your project and your mobile service need your Windows Store app's package security identifier and client secret. The push notification wizard handles all of this credential passing for you. In addition to handling all your credentials, the push notification wizard also creates a channels table to store all the Windows notification service channels. Also, it adds sample code to your project so that you can retrieve and send Windows notification service channels into the newly created channels table. And lastly, the push notification wizard initializes the insert.js script of your channels table so that you get a sense of how a toast notification is sent. Let's see what the push notification wizard looks like. So in the first step, I'm asked to sign in to my Windows Store. I've already signed in. You can move on. In this screen, I'm asked to choose from a list of existing app names. I can also reserve a new one. So I'm going to go with an existing one. In the last step, I'm asked to choose a mobile service. This mobile service will actually send the notifications. It's also the target for my Windows Store credentials. So I'm going to choose Canada Tracker 12. Now in this screen, just like in the Services Manager, you can also create a new service if you haven't done so already. So we've done a bunch of things for you. As you can see from the Server Explorer, we've added a channels table. We've also created a file for you called the pushregister.cs. What we're doing here is basically we're obtaining a channel from the Windows Notification Service, and we're uploading it to the newly created channels table. In addition, in your app.xaml.cs, when your application is launched, we're calling this new upload channel method that we just created for you. Finally, we've modified the insert.js script so that you get a sense of what the send notifications method looks like. You can take the send notifications method and paste it into any other script for either this table or another table. If I hit F5, I should see a sample toast message from my mobile service. In addition to see where this uh, toast, in addition to see where this push notification was sent, I can view my mobile service logs. To see my mobile service logs in Visual Studio, I simply select my service, right click, and hit the view logs command. This will pull down your server-side logs from the cloud and show it in Visual Studio. This will pull down your server-side logs. Logging is also the best approach for debugging your server-side scripts. In this video, we showed you how you can build a connected app using tools for Windows Azure Mobile Services. We really appreciate you watching this video and look forward to your feedback as you try out the new Visual Studio. Well, hello everyone. Hello, hello. Cool. Thank you very much for coming. Last day of build. Friday. Thank God it's Friday, right? It's been a while. It's been a long week. It's been a long week for us. We launched a new product yesterday. It was exciting. Um, my name is Yohai Kiryani, and I'm a program manager on the Azure team, specifically working on Azure, uh, Azure App Service. I've been with the program for five years now. Uh, basically from the first day, through all the progression, and here we are today. Um, so thank you very much for coming. It's Friday, I know it's late, uh, almost the last session. Again, thank you for sticking around. I uh, appreciate it very much. And um, before we start, uh, if you guys want to uh, come forward, it would be great. I got some uh, uh, vintage memorable over here. Uh, these are uh, Microsoft Azure uh, websites ball with the right logo, but the wrong name. 
So some of you are smiling, so I guess you remember that. Cool. Um, so today we're going to talk about how can we build a hyperscale web application um, on running on, uh, on app service. Um, and the reason I want to uh, have that session with you guys is basically over the course of the, of the five years we've been working on the project, we've seen a lot of customers. Uh, customers like you, and again, appreciate the fact that you guys are using the platform. By the way, how many are running apps on app service? Okay, only a few, half about, what? A third of the audience, cool. So some of you might find this interesting. Um, so over the course of the year, we, we've been working with a lot of customers and want to share some of that knowledge. And over the last, uh, last I don't know, 12, 18 months, We've seen a surge in what we call internally large apps. And large apps are anything that actually pushes many, many millions of requests um, in any given day. Um, so with that in mind, what we want to do is actually go ahead and, and share some of, that, some of these learnings. So what are we going to do? So we're going to talk about customers. We're going to see some marketing slides, unfortunately, to see some, uh, some customers that are running on scale in Azure. Then what I want to talk is about scale option. Where we at, just to make sure that everybody here are on the same page with respect to what are we going to cover. And then what I want to do is I'm going to talk about, uh, I guess, for about 50 minutes uh, about uh, practices for scaling, basically specifically on the back end for app service. This talk, um, this talk will have a little bit of code, a little bit of Visual Studio, but it's not your traditional, hey, let me open Visual Studio, run some code, hello world, and stuff like that. It's a little bit uh, deeper at different levels. Uh, but I still hope there are still some cool demos, and I still think we're going to enjoy this. This could well be a lesson learned from, so like lesson learned from this project or that project. But it will be presumptuous of me to assume that whatever we learn on one project can fit everybody, because it's not one size fit all kind of message. However, there is a small list of, how do you move here? There is a small list of items that we're going to cover, but don't worry, actually don't need to memorize it right here. We're actually going to cover it uh, in depth a little bit later. So to begin with, actually, it's still acquiring, still acquiring assets. To begin with, uh, let's do a few customer examples, only a few, handful. Um, basically, Real Madrid. Real Madrid is a pretty big soccer club in, in in Spain, right, I hope. Um, and uh, <laughs> a little blackout here. And they have 450 million fans, and they wanted to build uh, an app to basically engage and work with the fan. So they came up uh, to Azure. We work with them together. They have their front ends, their API running on app service, serving a mobile application basically for all the fans to be able to customize data and so forth. But the app service is just the front end because they're being powered by Dynamics and Power BI and database and media and a bunch of other stuff. Again, tra traffic, um, driving a lot of uh, traffic spe specifically around season, games. Um, Jet, Jet is an e-commerce uh, um, e site trying to make some innovation around improving the e-commerce experiencing, optimizing uh, shopping experience. Um, and they're also using Azure. Uh, they're using web apps specifically around their front ends because they have a pretty impressive system running at the back end, including VMs and SQL and storage and machine learning, notification hub, bunch of stuff. Pretty cool. Um, next is uh, another, like a NASCAR example. They built a web and mobile experience for their uh, customer. And this is interesting because they, their traffic pattern is very spiky, right? Only when there are races, they're actually scaling up and they're getting hammered massively. And there is media involved in that, a notification hub, and they push live, res live results and live update to their customer all the time. So it's very interesting how they like spike and then go away. Um, again, using uh, app service as their front end for running up their application. And the last example uh, for this part is the Canadian broadcasting uh, company, CBC, that created an application for the Canadian uh, government for uh, the last uh, election that they have. And again, this was a pretty interesting one. It was a one-time event, obviously. The site is still there, but the spike was one-time event. When the poll closes, you can see here at the bottom, we had about uh, 800,000 um, 800, requests per second, which is quite a lot. And they pushed uh, 3.6 billion over only a course of six, uh, of six hours. Uh, and it was interesting because they went to kind of the higher end of what we call in terms of scaling. And we can, I can show you some of the techniques that we have used to actually support that. 
um, support that for them in this case. So the common thread across all those uh, solutions is they're all using uh, app service. Uh, they're all using app service as their front end for the application. Uh, we like to view app service as a platform that provides best in class, um, best in class platform as a service. Uh, it is fully managed, right? We take care of scaling for you. We take care of the OS, the patching, anything like all that. We actually take care of you. Uh, it provides superior DevOps, as like we like to call it, right? It's very easy to deploy. I don't know if you've seen, but you know, Git and all of the automation around that, and self-service, diagnostics, logs, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And it provides enterprise-grade SLA, is what we call it. High SLA, secure, everything that comes with the word enterprise associated with that. On top of that, we actually have several um, flavors or domain-specific features that we have for web, for mobile. Um, we have easy out, we have API, like API management, core, swagger, um, easy table. There is a bunch of stuff that we have provided on, as part of the platform. And we recently added functions. Yesterday we announced it, which is pretty cool. Event-driven compute, we'll see a little bit of that uh, later. And on top, you can see a bunch of apps. I guess that the uh, Real Madrid, for example, fall under the, digital com under the digital global presence, as an example. Jet is e-commerce. I guess the, both the Daytona and the Canadian government could be called as custom app, but you get the idea, right? Uh, you can run any kind of flavors on top of that. But actually, the best part in having app service is not just this slide or what you see here, is the entire ecosystem, which is part of Azure. The green little thing, or the green, not little, or the green box at the, at the top is, uh, is app service. It's what my team is working on. But the importance is that everything else around it, right? It's very uncommon to have an app, definitely of the example that I showed, that is only using app service. Majority of the apps, and I guess you guys are familiar with it, they're using a lot of many more uh, services. Whether you use SQL is for data, or storage, or tables, or queues, whether you're using you know, media services, or CDN, traffic manager, if you're going at the high scale on that part, maybe using machine learning, or event hubs, or anything like that. All of that falls together, basically, in terms of um, in terms of what we have to offer is coming with a solution. All right. So, scalability. When we talk about scalability, we talk about scalability as a system, right? Well, all of the examples or most of this session are gonna be focused on app service, but you have to remember there's a larger context. So the scalability is the ability of a system, what we like to call an app, to handle a growing amount of work, which we refer to as HTTP traffic, in a capacity, in, sorry, in a, cap in a capable manner, which I basically say doesn't go boom, um, or its ability to grow. Basically, if you have an app, scalability means that it can grow as tr more traffic comes through it, right? Increasing traffic, user capacity, whatever means actually want to be able to grow. And scalability point is the point in which your application breaks. So if you build a, a web or a mobile app on the client side, breaking point or scalability issue usually show like slow, errors, timeouts, anything like that. If you're building just pure API, you would probably hit the same thing uh, with latency or errors, or anything like that. Um, but the important aspect here is that the system is an app, and an app comprised of multiple building blocks. Often we get calls like a customer calls and says, hey, you know what, your ooh is not working as properly, and we are very angry and upset, and we're gonna move. And I say, okay, buddy, can we maybe help you a little bit? Yeah, we did this and that and so forth. And often we find, for example, that, hey, you have a slow web app because your database is pegged, CPU is 100%, and you forgot to index one of your tables. But it always, usually always manifests on the front end with the first interaction point of the customer. Okay, so with that in context, the scaling option in which we can talk about um, and want to have an offer is, uh, is basically what we call vertical scaling. Take an existing node, right, and scale it up. That's a very important aspect. Versus what we call horizontal scaling, where you basically take um, 
an increasing number of nodes, adding multiple of the same nodes. It's the, size, the size of them is important, but not really important. And we're going to mainly focus on what we call the horizontal scaling. OK, so the real agenda for what we're going to talk today, and I try to kind of gamify this part, is to have different level as we go through the proficiency and we go to the scale options and scale the letter of scale. You can figure out one to four, basically, what we have five, uh, five levels here. So, uh, so let us go. OK, so first, stateless, all the professional. Before we do that, let me just switch here just to show you what we're doing. Switch, 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 switch. OK. So, um, I'm running a, a, a scale test as we speak. I started, it just, I see it just started 45 seconds ago. I started a little bit before the meeting, uh, before the session. I'm gonna run for 10 minutes with the duration, and I'm gonna restart it again once, we, once this one is finished. But basically, it's gonna hammer one of my uh, applications. Um, this application, to be specific. Ooh. Uh, simple web app, looks, uh, loads uh, images, when it's supposed to load the images, when it loads images. No. You can see already see scale issues. All right, so while this is running, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so stateless app. What does stateless app mean? Stateless app means that you can scale horizontal, right? Um, and with that in mind, scaling horizontal means that you don't need to have any kind of persistent session or anything, any kind of persistency that is related to your VM. You cannot assume that you're going, your user will hit the same VM all the time. That's what you mean you can run horizontally, right? And it has to be stateless. You can't have any kind of session in your VM. Not a state session, um, any, you know, any like shopping cart, anything like that cannot happen, right? Furthermore, do not use file to maintain state. Uh, specifically on app service, I mean, it's a general practice. It's, it's not a good habit anyhow, but specifically on app service, which is a managed service, the disk behind is shared, okay? And when I'm saying, meaning a, disk, a shared disk, what I want to show you exactly is this. Who's familiar with this view? Who, who is using this? You, hey, Bo, Bo, vintage. Who else wants vintage? Hero, we have, I have plenty more, no worries. You'll get answers, you get chances. So, um, this is basically our uh, backend, or kind of, not really a backend, sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a, our Kudu project is a, it's extended management capabilities that we provide with every site. Uh, one of the things here is nice is to see the debug console, and on the debug console, I will show you later during the demo how to get to here. What you can see is your, your files, basically. So this is the folder structure of your application. I go to my, uh, not site extension, sorry. I go to my site, dub dub root, and here you see here is, is, is my app. Now the nice thing about app service is that if you have multiple VMs, all of the VMs are basically seeing the same thing. See, ignore this. I actually prepared in advance a place for this. Ignore that. Um, uh, all, file, all the VMs are actually seeing uh, this folder. So when people come and we talk to them, people still think VMs, right? Still think the same thing. Hey, I went to the portal. I scaled to four different instances. So my app runs on four different VMs. That is 100% true. However, when we ask them what else is happening on the system, oh yeah, we're just you know, running some files or we're running somewhere to like, you know, app data or anything like that. So guess what? Everything you're gonna write into your dub dub root, everything you're gonna write into your site is gonna end up across all the VMs, right? A very common uh, example would be uh, people using uh, Lucene as an example, right? Lucene is a very powerful and common search indexer. A lot of people are running Lucene when the applications start to maintain some state and index some stuff, and the problem that is a bunch of VMs comes in up and down at a random time, and that's going to mess up the indexer, because each VM is going to change indexing, going to write to disk and think that it's common. So please don't use uh, disk for any state. So with that in mind, these illustrations kind of tell the same. If you have anything within your app, just get rid of it, like move everything, database, obviously, but files, disk, session, anything has to go. All right, so next vintage opportunity. Who is familiar with the ARR affinity cookie? Oh, a few of you, but you're all the way at the back. Now I have to like, throw all the way? I'm going to try. All right, I'm good with that. Not bad. Who else? All right, I've got plenty more. There's a whole bag. 
All right, so the affinity cookie is something that is somewhat of a legacy, but it's there on by default. So you guys need to be aware of that and at least handle that. And because I'm already running low on time, let me just go to the demo, and that's it. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to get out of here at all. So here's an app that I have. Uh, it's my awesome web app. It's an app that we use to actually demonstrate a bunch of features that we have on the system. I mentioned a few of them in my talk, like easy auth to do authentication, sites, uh, staging slot to do the swapping and deployment and continuous integration, all that goodies. But for now, what I want to show you is this, the home page. Here is what I got as a machine name. OK? All right. So let me go back to the uh, Kudu and look at the environment. And on the environment variable, what you're going to see here is the machine name. And then you're going to see this instance ID. OK, one more option. Who knows what is this instance ID? Uh, no vintage. All right. So I'm going to tell you what is this instance ID. If you're going to go here, hit the F12 button, you're going to see uh, this resources. 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 Sorry. <coughs> Cookies. So this number, 8DE45, how you can see it, is pretty much the same number as here. And that's the machine ID. So when the Affinity cookie is on, which is by default, we return this to your request, every request. And the next time this site hits our front ends, we're going to look for that machine ID. We're going to route the traffic to the same VM. It's on by default. It's legacy. When we started building this a couple of years ago, this was a good practice, or not a good practice, so it was a, it was a very good uh, compatibility story for us. So you actually want to remove that. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and delete. Hit the refresh, and it comes back again. Let's delete it. Very persistent. Go easy off, and it's here. So you see the idea, right? You can't really get rid of it uh, that way. OK, so the right way to, delete of, to get rid of this uh, cookie is actually remove it from our uh, APIs. So I'm going to show you another cool trick. Who is familiar with, uh, who is familiar with Resource Explorer? Anybody? Few. OK, you guys definitely get something. Both. Hey. All right. Sorry if I hit anybody. So Resource Explorer is basically um, Azure Resource Manager is the new, new API. It replaces what used to call the RDE fee. Um, and the nice thing about Azure Resource Manager is basically its structure. It's nested. There's a hierarchy in the, in, in, there's a hierarchy in the, in the way that objects are being defined. So with that in mind, what we see here is basically all of my subscription. And for each subscription, you see all the resource group that I got. I really need to clean up. And within one of them, for example, you can go drill down all the way to this site. And this site, what you see here is actually the site object. If you make this request properly authenticated, this is a nice thing about it. It actually can help you learn about the API. You can see my subscription ID. You can see the resource group, the name, the provider, the site, and so forth. If you make this call, you're going to get this object back. This object represents the entire the object of the website, basically. You can see there are other, op other options here, like information. For example, deployments. If I go to the deployment tab, you'll be able to see that um, you're able to see that I'm using deployment, I'm using Git. You can see the user that made the authentication, the actual ID of the commit and everything, my message that went through it, and so forth. So you can see there's a lot of rich information here. Another thing I want to show you is instances. Instances actually show you the instances that you have for your app uh, within the app service. So guess what? Familiar with this name? Sorry, with this number? It's the same number. This is the instance ID. That's what gets back to you. Okay. So to get rid of that, we have to go back here, and we have to fiddle a little bit with the API. But to do that, before that, let me just uh, show you this. So this is my app. And if I want to go to uh, scale out right now, running on, only on a single box. So let me scale in the Save button. Save successfully. Cool. So it takes. A couple of seconds actually to run on more than one machine. So the system needs a little bit uh, of a response time. But the important aspect is this RD, which is D52 attached to 84D, uh, 8DE, sorry. Uh, I can refresh this forever and ever. Uh, I'm not going to get a new machine. OK? However, if I go to my resource, and let's try to refresh my site. Uh, 
This is this usually works. Do I get? Okay, let's see the instances. So I already have two instances. Okay, so at that point, if the system, if the database says that I already have two instances, and this is the second one, then basically I have two instances. However, I'm still stuck here on the same one. Now you may try, if you guys want to try, you can actually try and hit this. Uh, my awesome web app, azure.net, uh, azurewebsites.net, and probably you're gonna get maybe a different uh, instance. So let me go ahead. Nice thing about uh, the ability of this site, of the resource manager, is I can hit the edit, and if you fiddle here too much and you screw up, then your site is hosed, so don't. But there is something called client affinity enabled, and it's true, by default it's true. Let's set it to false, hit the put, I'm updating my record. Good, let's hit the get just for in case. And it is false, all right. So if I'm gonna refresh this, guess what? It's still here, it's supposed to be here, okay? Because that's my client. But if I delete it, and if hopefully this also takes time to propagate, so we need to try it several times, but let's see, let's hit the refresh. Still here, it could be also client, still here. Let's uh, do this. And it's not here, all right. So now when I'm gonna refresh this, see, a different one. It depends, right? There's not a lot of load, so it depends how the load balancing is gonna hit me. All right, then one number one worked. Okay, so we're back on this. So in disable your error cookie, it's good for you. Uh, and enable always on. Uh, always on is a setting on the, on the app. You enable it, it's a good thing to enable always on. Who is enabling always on today, for example? Okay, some of you, that's good. No vintage for you. Um, so, um, when you enable always on, if you have an app that actually gets hammered with traffic, always on is not really that matter because your site will be up basically most of the time because it gets handled traffic. The thing with what always on is that on the rare case that your app is not having traffic and for some reason we recycle your VM, you want always on to make sure that it's coming back alive. So keep always on on, it's good for you. All right, number two, experts. You know what experts do? Experts make sure that someone else is doing the job for them. That's what experts do. So level one and a half is let someone else handle the load uh, for you, and to be able to uh, particularly, specifically show that, I need to uh, refresh some of the stuff here. Oh, I'm not showing anything, sorry. which is not loading for some reason. All right, so this is a pretty simple app that we have um, that load images. Ignore this, this is basically uh, some uh, CSS issues as soon as I hit on one image, it loads, and uh, basically what you see is just part of that image and so forth. So specifically what I'm talking about, um, let someone else handle the stress is, is the following. Let me go back for a second. Um, hit the F12, we're gonna spend a lot of time in the, with this view. This time let's go and try and find an element. So any of those elements, each one that I touch, doesn't really matter. Each one that I touch, basically what you see here is that the actual image is coming from somewhere else, specifically coming from storage. Um, this is it, you can see here's the URL, let's copy it, let's go here, let's clean it up from the CSS mess. Um, Note it's even HTTPS at that point. Here it is. Whoops. Anyway, um, so this is one image and it's coming from Blob. That's the important aspect. And it's super cool because it's coming from Blob and not coming from your own VM, right? Images doesn't flow through your system, go somewhere else, very important. It's very easy and very scalable at that point because now your client actually what is doing, what is happening, and let me uh, show you the network for that. Clean up, let's go to one of those images. What you see here is actually a bug in the client because we are asking the SAS token multiple times for whatever reason, doesn't matter. 
What happened here is we, we made a request to our API. This is our site, public website, Azure websites. This is an API call. We'll do a post on the image. This is the option, basically, we're looking for. Hey, give me the ID. ID, give me the ID. Actually, uh, sorry, give me the ID of the, here's the ID of the image. Give me a token. We are returning you a token, and with the token, ah, oh, really? With the token, basically, we go ahead and make the ask for, for the blob, which is, which is cool. Another important aspect of that is, uh, if the demo works, is this. I can upload. I can do the same thing with an upload. Do you care if it's a ferry or it's the, do you care if it's, for, if it's big or small, anybody? No? It's just this little guy. Hit the open. Uh, uh, upload. Choose file. Doesn't matter. Open. Clean up. I'm going to do upload. And what you're going to see here is basically exactly the same thing. Let me try to. You guys can see. Cool. So we have made one request and basically saying, hey, there is a new image coming. Uh, we're going to upload it to you. And then through the client, we actually upload this directly into Blob Store. So even the upload doesn't go to our, through our system or through the app, basically. So it's, uh, it's the API handling, and the client is doing everything around that. It actually chunks everything. It goes up all the way in the image, and then we do some little bit more code around that. Um, where is this? Here is this. Uh, upload service. So what we got here is basically the following. Uh, we have a Azure Blob Upload, which is an open source stuff that we found, which is pretty cool. We basically, go ahead, chunks uh, any, any blob that you have, any media, any object that you're going to upload as a blob, and just basically just handle all the traffic to upload it in chunks, which is pretty nice. Uh, the upload service, sorry, upload service at that point, uh, it's a bunch of Angular that once you hit the upload, it actually gets a SAS URL, and it gets a SAS URL, it's all the way up here. You can see it makes a post to our API with enough information, get the results, the results returns to the user, and then I'm actually going to upload the blob with the token and everything else. So getting the files, reading the files, uploading the files, it's all being secured through the tokens, it's HTTPS, and the traffic doesn't go flow through our system, which is super important. Same thing happens with uh, mobile um, as well, but already had half an hour, so let's actually move on. Um, so that was storage, cache, and CDN we'll get to in a second. What we've seen is basically this. Um, it's what we've seen in core right now, so go away. Um, we make a request to our API. API returns us a SAS number two. is generate a SAS token, talk to the storage uh, SDK. On, but on the server side, not the client, returns the SAS token to the app. The app actually then take, upload the blob, and do the same thing for downloading and uploading. Okay, so we handle that part. Next question, why CDN? And I think the most appropriate answer is why not? Who's using CDN? Oh, a lot. So I don't really need to spend too much time on this. Um, cool, CDN is actually really important to use. As you can see some of the data over here. Let me uh, show you uh, why. We go in the network, let's close this. Did I hit refresh here? No, let's go ahead, clean this up, hit. So as you can see, script loading time, ooh, you can't really see, sorry. Let's light up another one. So as you can see, I just refresh. I can refresh again. Uh, and I arrange by type so we can see like all the scripts. So all the JavaScript are the best example. These are the load time for each of the file. 200 takes several hundred milliseconds. Please note they're all doing in parallel, so the Angular is actually doing it in the right way. It takes less than a second, but you get the idea. These are being transferred directly from my app. Okay? If I go to here, If I go here, should that in advance, and I hit the scripts, sorry, the type. So the scripts are weighted with three or four, but look at the time difference. 50, 50, 40, 50, 40, versus 
500, 600, an order of magnitude, right? I think that would be enough for this demo, uh, right? <laughs> and more. Now, you know what? Let me show you something else. It could be hard to set up a demo. You know, you need to set up a uh, sorry, set up a CDN. You need to go find a CDN, all that. It's not. Basically, if you go to uh, Azure, um, if you go to Azure, I already have it set up. I can show you how easy it is to set it up. Um, if you go to Azure, you can add yourself a CDN endpoint. Where's my CDN over here? Uh, this one. One of them. Can't remember which one. Yes, this one. Okay. So basically, it's it's that simple. You go ahead, you add a CDN, you choose, you add, can add a custom domain if you want, and you can go any custom domain, whatever you have. You add an endpoint. I add traffic manager because my this is for the next later stage of my demos, and that's it. You nothing else, right? And if you want to add a custom domain, if you own it, add a custom domain. We verify, and this is it. And behind the scene, everything is happening for you. Nothing else needs to happen. So it's super simple, super easy to actually do it and run the app. All right. Um, next. Okay, so we talked about resource optimization, letting someone else do the work for us with storage, true for any type of media. So we covered almost all the media in our application. Talked about CDN as well, makes sense. Cache is also a very good uh, practice to use, specifically if you um, have a lot of state that you need to maintain somewhere. Cache is a pretty good place to, uh, to keep it other than the database. Uh, avoiding disk. App service is a managed environment. Within a managed environment that we manage all the VM for and stuff like that, there are certain limitations that you might want to consider. Remember, we're using surge storage, uh, which means you have, could have 10 VMs. If you go to app service environment, you could have many more VMs. Um, and if, for example, all your logs and traces will go through our file system path to the storage, it won't be that optimized. Okay, by default, when you enable logs and traces, everything goes to disk. So what I'm gonna ask you guys to do is something very simple, is when you go, I can't remember which one, but we'll figure it out. Um, when we go to this way, where are we at? Diagnostic log. Application, anything that they do at the application level, it's a .NET application, so any system.trace, anything like that, will be intercepted, and we're gonna actually push it into a blob. And the same thing goes with my uh, server logging. Everything goes to a blob. Okay, it actually is easier, someone is waving, I can't see. Sorry? Ah. Thank you, Nir. I switched the screen, nobody else told me? All the balls back. <laughs> at least you guys are awake. Okay. So here we are at the app, and we went to the diagnostic log. And in the diagnostic log, you can see all the options that we have. We can have application logging to the file system. It's on. Actually, it should be off. <laughs> Oops. Uh, and then the application logging actually should go to the blob instead of the file system. Uh, why? Just to kind of explain that. You can control the error, the error level of the application logging, but that's a different conversation. This is a different demo. And uh, web server logging, which is more important, is your Aurora HTTP also push it into a blob. It's not really good to have it on disk. It's hard to get it out to begin with, but it's really bad to write it down, definitely if there is a lot of traffic. So uh, I can save. Yeah, I can save. Why not? Famous last word, right? Okay, so this actually ran fine, but for what I want to show you is I actually want to show you the blobs. So if I go, not this one, tables, queue, blob. So if I go to one of my containers, um, already I have, a, I have a, I already set it up. So it's here, and this is, a, this is according to a month, so 2016, March, uh, it will load 31st. You can see here, every hour basically has a log. Let me go to 06, and you can see, here's all the logs that I got. Um, pretty straightforward. All those little uh, numbers that you already probably should identify, they represent the first few numbers of each of that, um, first few numbers of the 
uh, machine ID that we are so you with the affinity cookie, basically. That's how you know that you're running on multiple machine, and it's going to guarantee the uniqueness of each machine if we actually rotate your machine. So good practice to have. Please do that. OK, and the last part is connection pooling, thread pooling, and uh, the up warm up, which is not really let other people do the work for you, but mm, kind of. So connection pooling is very important. Um, it both goes with HTTP and database. Database connection pooling is kind of obvious, I assume everybody are using. HTTP is a little bit less. Uh, for .NET, a developer is basically being done for you without doing you even know, knowing. Um, for other languages like Node or PHP, you actually need to take care of it. And why it's important. If you make any outbound uh, network connection, HTTP requests to any other API, right? The database, it also count, but I guess database are kind of managed. Uh, on the connection uh, for, for database, sorry. If you make any request, then it goes out, any outbound request goes to ephemeral ports. Those ports on a managed system, specifically on, on, on app service for the public, not app service environment, those are uh, expensive ports, and there's a fine limit to what, what you can get with them. So if you don't have connection pooling and you're making a lot of requests, like thousands of them, you're going to hit a limit, and that's going to you know, basically not make any more requests, not honor your request for you. Most people are not aware of that, and at that point, the app kind of doesn't work. Um, so with that in mind, be able to use connection pooling is very important. So let me see if I can find the code for this. OK, so I'm not going to show you the database connection pooling because it's built in because I'm using EF. But other than that, there is Service Point Manager, which changed the default connection limit. This is for outbound HTTP. So this is for the big prize. I hope Nir is OK with this. We're going to give away a shirt. Azure Functions, new shirt. It's going to be vintage at some point. Not today. Uh, with our new logo, App Service. So for the shirt, two questions. What is the default value? of the service point manager default connection limit for client and for server? Four? No, four is before, but not now. Yes? Anybody? Sorry? No. So for, sorry? Wait. Who said two? Who said 10? 10 for which one, client or server? Server. And for, for a client? OK, but both of you. Said it at the same time, so I have to fight for the shirt after the event. <laughs> Sorry. No, we'll figure it out. But you can go, oh, you want a ball? I can give you a ball for now. You already have one, right? All right, figure We'll figure it out. Don't worry, guys. I'll give you my shirt if you want. <laughs> Not this one, the other one. <laughs> OK, divide and conquer. Also very important. Actually, probably the, not the most important, but as important if you want to actually really achieve high scale at some point. So separation of concern, divide and conquer. Some people might call it microservices architecture, but we're not allowed to say microservice architecture in this conversation. So I call it just break your app to the smallest manageable logical components that you can scale each one individually, OK? So for the example that we're using, I got an API as a front end. I got my website. I got my image resizing that happens at the back end. Uh, and I got my client's code, my client's, my client's application that are running here. Um, if you're building a mobile app that uses API, so your mobile app uses API, communicates with your server back and forth, get data, and render it uh, on the device. Well, have you seen, as, as you've seen, we're trying to follow the same, pretty much the same pattern with Angular, with Angular or any other client uh, technology that you want on the website as well, right? So basically, your browser acts as like kind of a mobile client. You just go ahead and make an API request and then renders whatever needs to render. Doesn't really render CSHTML or anything like that. It's not that we don't have those pages within the app. Mostly, it's being Angular running behind the scene. Uh, and it's very important to be able to achieve that level of control. Um, so if we go here, um, what you see here basically is I got my, uh, my API app. I ignore the common model, just the idea that we use. We got my resize uh, web job. And my resize web job, basically, it's a console application. It's a web job. Um, who's using web jobs today? Over there. Ugh. Sorry. 
Um, someone here? Bad aiming. As I said, I have more. So um, basically, it's a console application that does all the magic for you, uh, but we can't deploy a console application in a nice manner. So what I did here is basically there is a small wrapper as a, as a web application that actually can be deployed uh, with ARM as a full package, the entire thing. So it's pretty cool on that. And then I got my APIs over here. Uh, I got my APIs over here. We saw some of them, like here's the image storage controller to get the SAS token. We've covered some of that and so forth. Um, and this is the app application part. As you see, there's a bunch of JavaScript and there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of model. It's not really a standard MVC application. So with that, we can actually deploy each one into individual uh, parts. So the next, this is where the slide gets tricky. So the next part of that is basically, hey, if you are doing that, then consider deploying um, every single component into a different app hosting plan, which will give you the ability basically to scale each one independently, depends on the load and the characteristic of your application, right? Because my API needs to be snappy, needs to be react, uh, react very fast, as lowest latency as I can get. And then everything else beyond that is kind of async operation, whether it's image processing, whether it's order processing, whatever you want to call that. Uh, that can handle somewhere else, and depends on the load, you can decide how you want to uh, scale each one of those independently. So if I go here, in my hyperscale demo resource group, if I look at all my resources, you see I have several applications. I have, I got Contoso Web. Is it okay with the fonts? Yeah, I got Contoso Web. I can zoom in a little bit. I got Contoso Web, which basically goes to my, uh, uh, it basically goes to our app service environment, the hyper P there, we'll get it in a second, here it is. Um, and I got another one, which is the public, which goes to a different stamp, it's a different deployment, it's the same app, they're both using the same database, they're both deploying the same region. Um, this one um, goes into basically uh, Bay 51, which is west, all right. Uh, the thing is that each one of those is deployed into a, a different environment, as I said, but specifically for API and web, so the, my web part of my public, uh, public goes into uh, Contoso Moments Plan, which runs right now on the standard, four larges. You can see four larges over here. Um, and if I go out and I can scale it out, it can do whatever I want with that at any given time. It's pretty cool. All right, auto scale setup and so forth. So with that, if I look at my other part of my, uh, of my public stem deployment, I deployed, I also have a web job, and my public Contoso web job, which again, just that one web job, is deployed into a different uh, hosting plan. And this hosting plan has only one small basic, because what I'm guessing or what I'm assuming here is that most of my applications will do reads, the front end needs to be very strong, and there will only be very few upload of images. Therefore, I don't need any beefy strong machine on the back end to actually process a lot of stuff. All right. So with that, so the next, next step is basically to run the thing uh, serverless with Azure Function. So we announced Azure Function uh, yesterday during the keynote, yay. Um, and Azure Function basically is an event-driven compute. It's allow you to run small pieces of code depending on events that happens. Uh, whether you, in our case, we're gonna upload an image to, uh, to a blob, something happens with your app, you wanna have a webhook, any other application or anything else we offer in terms of triggers with respect to functions. I'm not gonna show a lot of that, I'm gonna show very little, in fact, but just enough to get the idea of what we can do. And there is a small surprise. So, let's go to my funk. So this is uh, the experience for Azure Function. Oh, right, again. This is the experience to Azure Functions, because it doesn't change here, it's really uh, annoying. Uh, I, so I already have an, an Azure Function app, which hosts basically a bunch of functions for me. Um, the one function that I want to show you is actually the image, uh, image resize. So I'm not gonna write or explain too much of this, this is gonna go through uh, quickly to what you see here. Um, so I can import parts of stuff, 
uh, part of the basically import surface, import several assemblies into my application. There is a method, way to do it, so we can do it automatically when you deploy your functions. And I haven't shown you the, what the web job is actually is or what it's doing, but basically the web job that resizes the images is pretty much identical to the code that you see here, just even streamer, even less code in that part. So this is just enum for the size. This is the dictionary that represents the size. Other than that, what we do is here. And it's very nice. Um, we got a uh, we got a function that runs every time that something is appears on the stream as an input, which is the blob. So I'm going to show you the trigger. Every time we upload an image to the blob, this function is going to run, capture the input as a stream, and then write it out to blob output small and to blob output medium. And basically, what we do here is we there are the two lines of code that actually go ahead and build and run the image builder and pass those stream as parameters that we're going to write the updated image to it. And if I look at integrate, where the magic happens, is the trigger is being defined as an uh, Azure, uh, input from Azure Storage. And you can see here uh, the storage account information. And we're looking for input images as the container. And there is a generic parameter name that actually will follow through. And then I can define additional input, parameter, input uh, binding, which I'm not doing for this function. For the output, what I have is the blowed out small and the blowed out medium in this case. And I, the same storage account, this is the parameter that actually we're going to work with in the function. This is how the magic of the binding happen on the functions for you. So you don't really know. If you write the function, you don't care and know how to work with storage at all in this case. You just get the object, manipulate it, and work it out. And we're going to just write it to a different container with the same name. So after that, let's see if this thing is actually going to work. Uh, so here is the uh, here is my storage account. This is Storage Explorer. I already have an input, uh, an image on the input, uh, and on the small and on the medium. So let's actually go ahead and delete them all. So you can believe me. Okay. So those are in empty. OK, so let's upload one. Let's go with the Bumbies, this one. And let me show you. Huh. Let's clear, see the log. Let's clear the log so we can actually see it happening in the open. Image is up. And the function was started and actually completed. And if I go now to the other container, that you can see the image is here. Can look at the image, image, view. Here's the image. All right. This is why we applause. <laughs> Joking, sorry. Anyway, those are different images. You can see the size is, no, the medium size is uh, 184K and the small one is 114. So it's actually different in them. OK, so this was one aspect. There is more. I'll just show once I get this slide. So this is how our app looks like now. I have a very thin, thin layer of API logic that happens. I got my, uh, that handle the web client, the mobile client. I got my web app, which is just basically a container for all the API that I have, all the logic that I have in JavaScript. And that's about that. It runs in an app service environment, but we'll see it in a second. I have the queue, uh, the story, sorry, with the, with the with, with, I have this queue with, with story with the function, but that's one, just one aspect. So another thing I want to show you is I have another function called uh, webhook. Uh, and my webhook is doing something very, very, very simple. Basically, every time that someone, it's an HTTP, uh, sorry, it's an HTTP uh, trigger. So every time, sorry, I got another function over here, webhook. And it's an HTTP trigger function. So HTTP request comes in. And what I'm doing here is, other than returning an HD response, uh, I'm writing the, uh, the parameter, the message that comes in to an Azure uh, storage. And same thing, I got, uh, I got a work name. I got need to have partition and row key and so forth. So um, I get the object. Again, ignore the coding part about this. I get the object. Um, I do some testing, which are actually commented out. I create an object here to want to write to the item. And then I just go ahead and edit to my table. And that's it. And it's nice because I can actually go 
I can actually go uh, into my code. And you can see here that I'm actually using table logger to log the message. So here is the table logger logging the message. And I actually go ahead and put the information with the image ID and the album ID and the user ID into it. And to show you that this thing actually works, let me clear this. Um, let me hit refresh. Remember, every time we ask for a SAS token, we're actually going to get this. So this should actually show it multiple times, as you can see. So this is, you can see different image ID every time. Hit the pose. All the images that came through, this is how easy it is to work. And this goes directly into table store. So now I have a very nice, easy logger to have within my application. Well, this is cool. Let me show you something that we are uh, working with the partner. Right. So this is, uh, this is really, really uh, in, produ in production, in, in actual in development. Uh, we're, working with, uh, we, we're working with Splunk to enable Splunk as an output binding. So um, me writing into table store, it's nice, but it's kind of a poor man's solution. It's working. Uh, if you want to get to a very high scale and you want to be able to collect information, run analytics, and all kind of stuff on that, you can use uh, Azure App, App Insights. Uh, you can also use uh, Splunk. And, and we're working with Glenn Block. Glenn, if you're seeing this recording, thank you very much. Um, he actually went in, and because Azure Function is completely open sourced uh, and, all, and all that, uh, he basically went in and within uh, about 20 hours of work, uh, took and created a Splunk binding to uh, a function. So basically, if I go here, uh, and, and this is going to see it in Kudu uh, and not in the function portal because we haven't tied the hooks right now. But you can see here is a Splunk collector. Uh, if I go in, uh, this is the function definition. So these are the triggers and bindings. So you see there's a timer trigger here. And this is an output binding for a Splunk event collector. Um, just to make sure that you believe me, this view I can show it to you on the function as well. If I go into the integrate, there is an advanced editor which just show you the binding. So say this is my binding. So it's pretty much the same format, same binding. So there is a Splunk event collector. And the nice thing about it, once you have that and you add it to your binding, it's a cool thing about function being open source and all that. This is the code. I got a timer. You can imagine have any input. New Splunk event, which is an out object, as you can see here. And that's it. And it's done. Right now, it's showing bar demo. Let me remove the bar. That's it. Hit the Save button. It will recompile. Magic will happen behind the scene. And that's all. So now I can actually go into my uh, Splunk. And this is a Splunk deployment on Azure. It's being deployed. I deployed it using the new uh, Splunk ARM, uh, ARM template that they have in the, in the store. You can deploy it. And, you have uh, Splunk. And there's HTTP collector here. Uh, you get some token. Using this token, you can pass it in the information to your Splunk. And at that point, basically, I can go ahead and do some stuff if I would know how to use Splunk. I don't, sorry. Uh, I use for everything. And this is all the information. You can see full bar. You can see full bar demo, right? It's all the, the timer actually go ahead. And already the message is there. And every minute, you'll be able to see more and more messages. OK. So this is a little bit of the power of function and the serviceless aspect of that. And obviously, um, my, my, API, my API pushes a lot of requests to the, to the function that doing the HTTP. We will be able to scale it up. It's actually basically meaning the same scale as this guy, uh, if you think about it. Um, but it's happened behind the scene as a magic, so it's pretty cool. OK, I got two more levels in five minutes. That's going to be tricky. So app service environment. Who is using app service environment today? All the way up there? Um, quarterback, I'm not going to be. OK, so um, app service environment is an isolated environment from app service, right? If you run in, um, and the easiest way to do it is actually to do the following. It's going to be really quick because we don't have too much time. So this is one app that I have. This is running on the public aspect of app service. Sorry? 
Okay, so you can see here, this is my app, this is my, uh, this is the Alice, so this is the CNN that I'm using, Azure Websites, and it goes to Bay51, one example. If I go to my other one, which is this guy, then you see it's going to a different one. It's also in West, in Bay, but you can see this little GUID here. And basically what we've done here is app service environment is your own dedicated, isolated environment. So it's like, uh, it's like the public Azure uh, website offering in terms of the functionality and capability of the website. Everything is kind of the same. The only difference is we actually deploy in your own virtual private, in virtual network. This is your own dedicated environment. You control your faith end to end. Anything that you do there, it's up to you. So if you go, if you go to app service environment, what you'll see is, and there's uh, all the demos, by the way, that we've been doing right now, we've been doing, uh, this, uh, some of it ran with some stress on it. Um, what you can see is that um, um, you, you own the entire infrastructure in terms, of the deploy, in terms of the VM. So here is the front end. You actually control your front ends, how many front ends are in, in, in there. And you can see this is a little bit of the uh, scaling test and the load test that I've been pushing using Visual Studio. Um, you own, so basically, for example, I'm running on P3s right now and have four instances uh, for my front ends because that's where um, that's the front ends for your, for your stamp. And then you can see I can scale a lot if I choose to. I'm not gonna do it, but you can. Um, and the same way you can control the front end, you can control your worker pools. Worker pools are just a set of VMs. Imagine physical VMs, like real VMs. For me, you can carve logical uh, representation of your uh, app services. So over here, I have 10 of them that I have on my set. Two are being used, and seven are actually available. Only nine, because we keep one as a buffer. Um, when with that, um, and then you have a service plan, app service plan, right? The same one that we've talked with the different API and web jobs. Uh, and the service plan has, again, the same capabilities, and you can auto-scale the service plan but scaling the service plan within a worker pool will be limited to the number of VM available on the worker pool, and it's only up to nine. Remember, 10 is the number, we can only use nine. Okay, the important aspect of this, and this is need to check, chat a little bit about that. The important of this is basically, if you want to have a very massive scale, like really like tens of thousands of RPS requests per second, you have to go with up service environment. Because on the public up service, uh, our front ends are basically shared. I can give you 10 dedicated uh, instances um, on, on app service environment, even 20 with premium, but the front ends are being shared by everybody else within that unit of scale, that Bay 51, that IP, which is different. Um, and therefore, if you're pushing too much, you might saturate the, the traffic and first harm other people, and other people can harm you as well. So therefore, if you want to have a massive scale, you really want to go uh, into app service environment because of the scaling issues that you might have on that. Okay. So guidelines for app service uh, environment scenario. Determine your front, uh, your front end uh, sizes early, as I showed you. You can scale up. Adding machine is not that expensive. It takes about uh, 20 minutes to add the pool. I'm talking about the pool. Increasing the pool takes about 20 minutes because we're adding like physical VM to the pool, cloud service basically. But if you want to change the size of that, the change of size would actually mean we need to go through the entire pool. So if you have, let's say, 10 VMs, and you change from P3 to P4, we have to actually rotate all 10 of them, which is expensive in time. Okay, test early, test often, and test for load. And I cannot, cannot stress the importance of that aspect. We had two cases this week, internal Microsoft, so I can talk to them about them a little bit. One, one team came to us on Monday, says, hey, a build is coming, duh. Um, can you help us test the site? We have some issues with our performance, Monday. Okay, yeah, sure, why not? Um, nobody was there, I were flying already. And then yesterday, uh, during the keynote yesterday, I believe that uh, someone, Scott, announced there are some certain mobile development tools are free. Uh, but while they are free, you still need to get a license key. Um, and the site was running on us, and guess what? Right? Uh, and they didn't even, yes. So you get the idea, and the problem eventually wasn't on R, it was the code itself. So long story short is, 
Test early. Please, our servicing team will be very happy. I'll buy you personally a beer. Okay, and test often, test all the time, before and after, not two days before lunch. All right, um, if you want to talk about strategies about scaling and testing, the best way to do it is basically set up small, two front ends, two worker, and break your system. Find that scalability point that we've talked about early on the first slide. Break the system, this is your multiplier, how you're going to add up. Uh, and then scale up with uh, ACE for performance testing and so forth. Uh, let's see, we're out of time, so let's actually go fast. So, last level, geo-distributed, um, more is better, nothing else we can say. Um, sometimes even you need to go scale beyond the sizes of up-service environment. We had cases like that. Good thing, up-service environment gives you the own dedicated IP, so traffic manager at that point, you can do whatever you want. And again, it's super easy to actually go ahead and, and make those changes. This is my traffic manager, and you can just add more and more and more endpoints, assuming traffic manager would load. Or not. See, I over time, so traffic manager knows that. Anyway, it's very easy to load endpoints, thank you, uh, and simply just add more endpoints. It can be, geez, it can be external, it can be Azure endpoint, you can go with app service. And you can choose any one you want, any, any endpoint you want. So it's very easy to set up and it's working because most of my demos were doing through one of those. The thing is with that is that your app now needs to be on the same page. So with app service environment, for example, you can actually host two different applications in the same region, which is a little bit tricky with not using app service environment. In this case, I'm using the same database and the same storage. It's easy. When you go and try to do it with a different region, it gets a little bit trickier because then you need to figure out your application. Read, writes, you know, uh, fail, uh, active, 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 passive, all kind of that. So there's a lot of work to be around. But basically, the setup that we've seen today is a CDN, traffic manager, an app service environment, uh, a regular uh, uh, app in the, up, in the, in the public uh, app service, both using the same database, basically, um, with the function. Uh, around that, and that's it. And this can scale like a lot. I'm trying to break the system with the tools that I have. I failed. I was even scaled too much on that. Okay, and with that, since I'm kind of over time, this will be the last slide. Things to remember, stateless. Keep your app stateless, please, please. It's the one thing that you probably have to do if you want to scale. Um, resource optimization guidance was the part that let someone else do the work for you, right? Use other tools, use other services, figure out how you can offload work from your system. Test, always test, always test for load and perf, specifically if you know that the stuff is happening or going to happen. App service environment supports hyperscale. Some of the customer that we've seen early on, uh, the customer example uh, kind of uh, state for that. Uh, and basically what I'm saying is, hey, Everything I showed, talked to you about here is pretty, uh, it's out there and it's runs on app service. Let's you basically focus on your app and forget all the underlying infrastructure because I haven't shown any specific tricks here, but it's just an app that runs. And if you keep those few simple rules, then we will do the rest of the work for you. My team will take care of the scaling for you and that part. And with that, what next? Try Azure Function. You've seen some of it. You can go to try Azure Function, functionazure.com to try it. Try up service if you're not using up service. I saw a few hands of people that did not raise their hand when I asked who's using. If you want to contact me, this is my contact information. I am the last session of almost today, so thank you for coming on Friday. And, uh, and please give us your uh, feedback. We live and die by, uh, by the evils of the session. Thank you. Oh, balls. These are a few, few more. A few more balls and stickers if anybody wants balls and stickers. Uh, sure. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, .NET Conf. Uh, my name is Adrian Hall. I'm the program manager for Azure Mobile. And today, we're going to be taking you through Azure Mobile apps. And we're going to go beyond the basics. So what are we going to be covering here? Um, First of all, I'm going to go quickly through building and publishing an Azure mobile app, and then we're going to deep dive into how to make line of business apps for, uh, for mobile apps, so cloud-enabled line of business apps. And that includes taking Azure AD, 
uh, which you've probably already connected to your uh, corporate AD infrastructure, and adding that authentication mechanism to your mobile back end. Then we're going to add AD authentication to your mobile app. And finally, we're going to be covering two, um, two topics. Um, the first of one is personalizing a uh, table endpoint, and then we'll go into some troubleshooting questions. Along the way, please do um, ask questions. Uh, we are uh, we're going to have them pop up here, and I'll cover them uh, as I uh, as I get time. So, what are we not covering? We're not going to be covering the basic creation of a mobile app. Uh, we're not going to be covering deployment of a SQL Azure database, and we're not going to be covering the basic Xamarin Forms apps. There are excellent quick starts available. Uh, on Azure.com for the mobile app and SQL Azure database, and on Xamarin.com for the Xamarin Forms app. So we're not going to be covering those uh, topics. So let's dive right in, and I'm going to create a mobile ASP.NET app. Uh, everything here is, um, is going to be C-sharp.net, uh, but uh, just be aware that if you, uh, if you really want to concentrate on uh, Xamarin and you just want to uh, focus on the um, the capabilities of the back end. We do have uh, easier no code capabilities available. So I'm just going to log into my um, really. <laughs> I'm going to ah uh, uh, the perils of live coding. Um, <laughs> typing straight. Uh, I'm just going to log into my Azure.com uh, site and the portal. And you'll be able to see here that I've already created a .NET Conf um, uh, website. Now, how did I do that? I clicked on this big plus sign. I searched for mobile app. And the very, very first setting is, if I can just uh, find it, is there's mobile app. So, so you really want to. Um, click on this mobile app. Don't really don't do mobile service. That's uh, it's no longer preview. It's actually deprecated, um, and you can't. If you're a new customer, you cannot actually create those. Once I've uh, done that, I'm going to come into my Solution Explorer in Visual Studio, and I just created this application through the file add a new project. And there is, in the cloud environment, there is an Azure mobile app there. Now, this does require the Azure SDK. And make sure that you are always on the latest version of the Azure SDK. Right now, that's version 2.9. Uh, that will give you these capabilities. And that is literally all I have done to this. Now, to publish this, this is really kind of uh, uh, easy. But there are a couple of gotchas that you need to be aware of. First of all. We have a capability within the Azure portal called Easy Tables. And that's really where the quick starts take you. So if you've already done the quick start, you've created your mobile app, and you've deployed Easy Tables, you'll want to wipe out that Easy Table configuration before you publish this. Um, that's easily done through here. So I'm just, I just right clicked on the project, and I clicked on Publish. I'm going to select my Azure App Service. I'm going to need to re-enter my credentials. Um, it times out after a while. Um, and I obviously can't type today. Always a wonderful sign. There we go. Um, once you've authenticated, it will refresh the subscriptions. If you've got multiple subscriptions, you'll see all your subscriptions here. I only have my MSDN um, subscription that comes with Visual Studio Enterprise. So I'm, I'm going to uh, select that one. And here's my conference. Uh, resource group, and there's my app service. So I can click on OK. Now, once you've got that uh, done, it will actually fill in an awful lot of the information for you. It pulls this down. Um, there are a couple of alternatives, FTP, but the web deploy uses port 433. So that really gets by most firewalls that are out there. Um, so you can uh, deploy easily. Next one, click on Next, because there's some real interesting options here. The first one is the file for publish options. If you have, in, if you have uh, implemented easy tables and now you are swapping over to ASP.NET, ensure you click the Remove Additional Files at Destination. So that will be a requirement. And if you are doing um, 
code first migration. So uh, at the end of the day, the mobile app is an ASP.NET with Entity Framework built in. And that means that you have to deal with Entity Framework migrations. If you have done a migration, you'll be able to check this box and uh, it will actually execute for you on the back end. So now you can click on Next and now you can click on Publish. Uh, that's how you uh, publish a site. We want to go a bit deeper though. So first of all, some, some notes. Um, Azure ASP.NET Mobile Apps uses Entity Framework. Make sure you deal with the EF migrations. I mentioned that. Um, really, the right-click publish is for development. If you are using, if you are doing a production deployment, you probably want to set up a production staging environment. There is a feature on a Azure App Service called Slots, uh, and it's available in the All Settings uh, pane. I'll uh, just show that off. So I'm just going to go back to my main page, and I'm going to go into my uh, .NET Conf um, site. And I'm in all settings. And down near the bottom, there is deployment slots. And this allows you to create that staging slot. So you have your production slot, and you have your staging slot. What you're going to do is use continuous deployment against the staging slot. So then you can test your staging to make sure that the migration took hold, that your mobile apps still work with the staging site. And then you can do the swap slot uh, to swap it into production. That way, your production environment is not affected as you are making sure that your staging site is working. If you have a problem, uh, and as I said, the specific problem is easy tables being transitioned to an ASP.NET application. Make sure you clear all the files. It's an option under settings in the publish dialog. And be aware that when you publish, we've got to shut down the old site, and we've got to bring the new site up and do the connection to the, uh, to the back end uh, database. So there is a startup cost. What happens, and it should have just happened here, is you will always get a website coming up once it's been published properly. Uh, even if you don't have a home site, as I don't in this version, um, you're always going to have something, that a web server, uh, sorry, a web page that actually pops up. So make sure that you wait for that before you start testing your back end, because that's your indication that it's actually published properly. So let's go on to Azure AD authentication. Azure App Service makes this really drop-dead simple for you to do. I'm going to go back to my, um, my uh, Azure portal here. And I'm in, as you will uh, no doubt remember, my ASP.NET application. So this is the Azure App Service. It's my mobile app. Under Features, there is a whole bunch of things. But the one that I'm going to be concentrating on here is the authentication and authorization site. I can click on this, and it's normally turned off. I don't have any authentication. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn on authentication. And this actually gives you a whole bunch of information. You can configure Azure AD, which we'll do in a moment, Facebook, Google, Twitter, or Microsoft accounts. Now, the four social uh, accounts, you're going to have to go somewhere else to actually pull a client ID and client secret to configure the application. In the Azure Active Directory case, you're not. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into Azure Active Directory, and we've implemented an easy way of getting this configured. Click on Express, and scroll down a bit, and you'll notice it's going to create a new AD app. Now, if you, ha if you are configuring a staging slot, for example, you may want to select an existing AD app so that your production and staging slots have the same, um, same environment. I'm going to create a new one. And it's going to give me a name. In the Azure AD part of the portal, this is going to appear. I'm going to click on OK. That's all I need to do. Literally, that is configuring the Azure AD to use so that my website can use it. The final thing that I'm going to do is up here in the action to take when request is not authenticated. Now, a lot of people mistakenly say, well, that's the authentication that I want to use. This is really a distinction between, do you want the app service to handle authentication for you, or do you want your app to control the authentication? 
Um, now, most people have a have a uh, a number of pages that they don't want authenticated. For example, your home page you might want to be not authenticated. Um, you might have a configuration API that you want to be not com not uh, authenticated because it passes information down to your mobile app about the uh, uh, about the server. So inevitably, when you're doing a mobile app, you want to say allow the request. This doesn't say that authentication is turned off. This just says that your app, your mobile app, is controlling whether a page is authenticated or not, rather than the app service assuming that every single page needs to be authenticated. Once you've done that, click on Save. And that will, that will uh, save the uh, options. So a couple of authentication tips for you. Um, we're going to be implementing what we call server flow. Now, server flow is great for web apps, and it's also great when you're doing a mobile app and you just want authentication quickly, but you're going to handle the more complicated scenarios around authentication later on. We recommend for production mobile apps that you use a client authentication. Now, that means that, for example, if you are wanting your client to be authenticated with Facebook, you use the Facebook SDK to authenticate your user in your mobile app, and then you pass the token that you get back from the Facebook SDK to the mobile back end, and it will actually swap it for a mobile, so mobile apps um, token so that you can then continue to use it. The second thing is dealing with the refresh problem. Um, refresh tokens are an interesting topic. Basically, we use a token-based authentication mechanism. That means that you authenticate through an OAuth uh, flow and you get a token back. Now, that token has an expiry time. Uh, what happens when your mobile app moves beyond that expiry time? And the answer is, is that most environments, uh, MSA and Twitter being the, 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 the catch-ups uh, to here, they don't have this facility, um, but most of the others have a refresh token. And that's something that you can request during your, your authentication process. You get a refresh token back. And then when you time out, you submit the refresh token to get a new token back. So you need to deal with this refresh problem because you are going to bump into expiry times. And it's generally, you know, it could be a day, it could be a month, it could be a week. We don't know. It could be an hour, it could be a minute. Um, you just don't know when that, uh, when that expiry time is going to hit. So deal with this problem up front. And finally, you can test the authentication server flow by yourself. So once you've set it, set it up, and we can actually try this out now, um, I'm going to go to slash dot auth slash login slash AAD. And it's actually going to redirect me to, to the login page. Now, I've already logged in here but since I've been testing this app. So I can, I've successfully logged in. Now. I can go to my endpoint, and here's my big token. Let's just get rid of, uh, rid of that. It's a huge token. And go to https ahol.net.net conf, and there's my original. And I just take the slash dot auth, and I go slash me. And this gives me a JSON document that describes all the claims that we made. So for example, I know that my email address is photoadrianoutlook.com. I know my, my name is Adrian Hall. And I know where I'm coming from in terms of the identity provider. I know who actually identified it. So that's how you test the auth flow. Um, go to slash dot auth slash login slash provider, and it's Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google. Uh, Microsoft account or AAD, uh, the tokens for the provider, and go through the auth flow, and then take a look at the information with slash dot auth slash me. So next, I'm going to go over to some coding. And uh, this really comes down to, how do I cross-platform add this information in? So I've got, I'm going to, I'm going to take the uh, back end out of the way. I've actually got a Xamarin Forms app. Now, after I installed the Xamarin, um, the Xamarin plugin for Visual Studio, I just went in and I did add new project to this same project. And down in the 
where is it? Uh, the uh, the window, Visual C Sharp, cross-platform, there we go. In the cross-platform, there is a Xamarin Forms for Universal Windows, Android, and iOS. Um, and that's the project that I created. I, now, I said I wasn't going to do a uh, create the, the, the whole app, but I am going to do a little bit. So the first thing is, is I need to actually, the, there are three parts to this. First of all, there is the portable uh, library. Now, that is a, that is a common code to all three platforms. So when I compile this on the relevant platform, I'm going to say I want the iOS version, or I want the Android version, or I want the UWP version. It's going to automatically compile the, uh, the, the shared code, and then it's going to compile the UWP version. It's going to put them together to produce your app. So it, within, the, within the capabilities of the, uh, of, of the uh, app, I want to be able to produce this login page. So this, this uh, application right now, it doesn't do any authentication. It's just your basic to-do list that you open up and you've got to do. And it's shared across everybody. And I want to be a bit more prescriptive about it. So I want to be able to provide authentication. And when the user is authenticated, I want them to see their own to-do list. I don't want them to see everybody's to-do list. Now to do the authentication piece, unfortunately, authentication is platform-specific code. Every single platform implements how to deal with the UI slightly differently. So we need to deal with that. The, what we're going to do is we're going to use a Xamarin Forms capability called dependency service. Now, dependency service says, take an interface, take a .NET, a, a C -sharp .NET interface, and define that. And then in each of your platform uh, projects, define an implementation of that interface. And then in your common code, you're going to look up that interface, find out the, the concrete uh, implementation of it, and then, and then use that. So first of all, in my services, I've, I've already created a service locator singleton here. Um, I'm going to add a new item. I'm going to add an interface, and I'm going to call it iLoginProvider. Now, iLoginProvider, it, uh, it requires an async login async, and I'm going to pass in the mobile service client that I'm using. Async would be good. And in addition to that, I'm going to provide a logout async. And I'm just going to uh, do the, uh, the, the use all the helpers so I bring in my write library. And that's that done. Now, in the UWP project, I'm going to create a concrete example of that. So I'm going to add a class. And I'm going to call it UWP login provider. And that's going to implement my iLogin provider. And I'm going to bring in the that capability as well, which should be just using dnc to do dot services. It should be there. Do I need to build it? Let me just build it. Probably the best way. OK. There we go. So now, come on. Quick actions, and I need to implement that. So my async task login async takes a mobile service client. And in the, case of the, uh, in the case of the UWP version, all I need to do is do a client.login async. But because I'm using AAD, I'm going to go mobile. Let me just bring in the, uh, the appropriate uh, library here. 
mobile service authentication provider, and there is a Windows Azure Active Directory. So, and I'm going to await for that since I'm, a, I'm on an async. And I can do the same thing for the logout async. Again, it's a mobile service client. Like that. So, so that will that will now um, do its job. Now, what about the iOS and the Android version? Well, let's take a look at the iOS version first. So here is my iOS version, and I mentioned that uh, dealing with the um, the the capabilities of the individual platforms is necessary. In the case of the iOS platform, I need to provide the root view. So here is my root view controller, and I've got to pass that in. So fortunately, that is a a, a global variable in the um, in the iOS version, and that's all I need to do. In the Droid version, there's something a bit different because I actually need to initialize this with a context, and the context needs to be passed in. This is very common in Android Xamarin Forms applications, as you'll see. So I store the context in a local variable, and then in the login async, rather than passing the root view as I did in the iOS version, or nothing at all in the UWP version, I'm going to be passing in the context. Now, I do need to initialize that, and that is done in the main activity page. I'm waiting for this window to go away. Um, so I'll just scroll up, and you can see that what I do is I actually use the dependency service to, um, uh, to actually get that. So that's how I, I, I initialize the, uh, the Android version. So that's the, once I've um, done that, then I need to switch back to my, uh, my Azure App Service. And excuse me while I, while I switch off the uh, Visual Studio and bring it back to get rid of that window. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make an easy method of uh, getting the to the login async and the logout async from my singleton. And this is a fairly common pattern where I use the singleton that I'm using for my mobile apps to access the things in the dependency service. Um, so let me just reload quickly. Go back into my project. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the class dependency service. So here's my Azure App Service class. And what I've done is I've created login async and login logout async. Now, instead of throwing a nice exception, I'm going to use var lp equals. Now, the dependency service is a um, is a singleton itself, and I'm going to get the implementation of iLoginProvider. And then I'm going to call on that. I'm going to await lp.loginAsync, and you can see that that's, uh, that's completed for us. And similarly, in the logout async, I'm going to get the concrete implementation of I login provider, and I'm going to await lp.logout async. Now, there is one thing I forgot to do, and I apologize for that. In the, if I look in the iOS version, you can see this assembly at the top. Now, what that is doing is that is registering this class as being the concrete implementation of the um, of the I login provider with the uh, dependency service. So what I need to do is I need to go down into the UWP version of this. And at the top, I need to, oops, just make sure I'm putting, yeah, it's at the, uh, it's at the namespace level. I'm going to put that there. 
And instead of iOS there, I'm going to say this is the UWP version. And Xamarin Forms will take that dependency and it will say this is the concrete version of the iLogin provider. Then my Azure App Service will actually, it, that actually implements that. Um, it will actually, when I do the dependency service.get, if I'm running on uh, UWP, it will actually uh, get that uh, login async. Now, as I mentioned, I would normally implement this with uh, ADAL library or if the Facebook SDK if I was doing Facebook authentication. So whichever one you use, and then I would do, do the swap over of the tokens. If you want to see that in action, please do refer to our developer guides that's on azure.com. Click on documentation, web and mobile, mobile apps, and under the developer section, they are there. So some hints and tips. First of all, use a singleton in your mobile app to access Azure mobile apps. We store the authentication in that object. So if you don't use a singleton, you have to manage the state of the authentication. That's No one wants to do that. Um, I use a service locator class that's a simple uh, thing, much of the same API as the dependency service to locate my uh, singleton. And finally, login logout is platform dependent. Sometimes you need additional initialization, particularly Android. So use the dependency service to link in the platform dependent code. So let's go back to our table. And that's enough uh, uh, live coding uh, for right now. Um, now, how do we create a personal table? Well, in the regular to do list, you've got two fields you've got a text field, and you've got an is it completed field. Um, and that's actually implemented in my to-do item field. <laughs> and I've uh, got, uh, I'm just going to correct this because everyone's uh, pinging me. I forgot to make the interface public. Um, great point, guys. Thank you very much. It's uh, nice to have a, uh, uh, an awesome uh, uh, team there. So public interface, that should now make everything compile. Um, the last thing you want to do on stage is, make, is do a whole debugging session. So let me just close some of these down so I can get to my to-do item again. So here's my to-do item. I've also included the fields. So let's get back to the back end. So here is my data object. Now, uh, a DTO, or data transfer object, is your model with some extra fields. And those fields are in the um, uh, are in this entity data class on the back end. On the front end, you're going to have to create them yourself. So just to show you how to do that, um, here is my portable class. Here is my models. Here's my to-do item. And you notice there's this Azure Mobile Apps fields. What I've done is I've created the fields for you um, there. And they should be included in any model on the front end. So you've got an ID. Now, in mobile apps, the ID is a string, not an int. Um, you've got a couple of date times that are used for incremental sync. And you've got a version which is used for conflict resolution. So you definitely need these four fields. There is a fifth field on the back end called deleted, and that's used for soft delete, which is um, basically if you have two devices that are accessing the same data, so maybe you've got a tablet like I have here, and you've got a phone, and they're accessing the same data. If you delete on one, you want the other device to be notified that that has been deleted. So that is what we call soft delete. And that what, what happens is we mark something as deleted, and then the other device will download that mark, and it'll say, OK, you've deleted. Uh, I'll delete the record off the mobile device. And then later on, sometimes a week, two weeks later, you're going to clean up the database to remove all those soft delete marks. So that's my to-do item. Now, it is not uncommon for the two areas to be different. And you'll see that here. I've actually added an owner field. Now, that owner field does not get transferred to the, to the uh, mobile app. Or rather, it does get transferred, but it gets ignored. That owner field is where, we are going to where we're going to store the SID. Uh, the user ID. In my controller, I've got a con to do item controller. Now, how do you, what's the best way of creating controllers based on that model? Well, you can actually do add a controller, and 
Within here, there is an Azure Mobile Apps Table Controller. That's something that the Azure SDK gives you. And you can add it from there. It will ask you for a model and a database context. So I've got my to-do item controller here. I'm just going to hide the Solution Explorer. And the first thing I'm going to do is get a SID. So a SID is a security ID. It does not change no matter what you do on the authentication provider. So that SID is a unique combination for this application that you've defined and the user that is being uh, accessed from the back end. So uh, it does not fall if your user changes their email address in Facebook, for example, the SID remains the same. So this is a great way for storing data where you don't know whether the user can change their email address. Um, it's not associated with the user. So you look at it, and it's just a string of digits. Um, it's a SID dot something, some hex uh, string. So you can't tie the user to the SID. So it's, it's really hard to get information about a user. And that's a good thing, given the number of uh, hacking attempts and, uh, uh, and data uh, uh, theft that's uh, going on. After that, they're each of the um, each of the functions that actually returns values has been adjusted. So, for example, in the original version, I had a return query, and that says return all the records. Now, instead of return all the records, I want return all the records where the owner matches the authenticated user. So here, I'm using a link query to augment the query that's being passed in to actually do that. And the query that I'm doing is the item.owner, which is my owner field, matches the SID. In all the other cases, and you can see a lot of these, I'm going to be doing basically the same thing. So I'm going to look up the, uh, the ID that's being asked for the get single. I'm going to turn that into a queryable, and I'm going to make sure that the user has access. If the item does not exist, or the item is not owned by the user, then nothing is returned. For patching or um, deleting, there's a bit more to do. Um, I need to actually respond with appropriate uh, responses, because I don't want to in inject a security concern where someone can tell that the item exists but can't get access to it, because that gives them a vector for, actual, uh, uh, for actually doing things. So, Instead of that, that, I actually check to see whether the user can access the, um, uh, the uh, item. If the item is not there, then I return not found. If they can't get access, I return forbidden. Otherwise, I update the record. Similarly for the, um, uh, for the delete. Now, in the case of the post, again, I don't want someone injecting information in uh, arbitrarily, even if they're authenticated. So I'm actually going to explicitly set the owner field to the appropriate value in the back end. And that prevents a lot of the security issues. And that's all there is to producing um, this custom table. Now, there are other ways of producing this custom table, but this is the one where I, I like where you're using link to actually get the, uh, the appropriate queries sent to the back end. Now that, I've, uh, now that I've got this, again, I can just publish and uh, get updated. But remember, if you change the model, you have to do a entity first, entity framework migration and upload that migration to get the extra field in. So always consider that as you're going to production. So a couple of um, mobile back end tips. Um, the first one I've got is secure the server and the client. Uh, don't rely on the server. Don't rely on the client. They're, they they really need uh, both. Um, but make sure, definitely validate all the fields coming from the client. You never know how you are going to get attacked. And a note, I, I get a ton of questions on Stack Overflow on the MSDM forums about where's the app key? How can I secure my app with an app key? Don't use an app key. Um, App keys are inherently insecure. They are easily sniffed. And if you're relying on an app key to secure, so that, for example, a lot of people want to ensure that their mobile client is the only client accessing their, their uh, service, the app key is not the way to do it. Um, validate all the fields. So you don't know what information or who is sending 
You can't assume that your mobile client is the one that's accessing your mobile back end. So make sure that you're validating all the fields, both on the client and the server. And invalid fields is very common to send a 400 bad request. You can, in the back end, you can just throw a new HTTP response message with a bad request um, piece. And finally, we did make some, um, uh, we did make a, a Xamarin Evolve um, a video on this. Uh, it's called Addressing the OWASP Mobile Security Threats. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a great video, and I uh, highly recommend as you move through your application development, do take security seriously and, and watch that video and, uh, uh, and deal with the threats. And with that, we've come to troubleshooting. I'm going to um, show off a, a bunch of, um, uh, of troubleshooting techniques. The first one is, how do I get logging? So a lot of times when, uh, when someone asks us a question on Stack Overflow or on MSDM forums, we say, well, what does the log show? And the next question out of pretty much everyone's mouth is, well, how do I get that? There are two places. First of all, you need to actually enable logging in your back end. That is done the same way you do entity framework. And that is in the, in the database context that is uh, created. So here's my database context. And up here, I'm going to go this.database.log equals console.write. That is the entity framework method of, uh, of logging the queries that come back and forth. There we go. And I'm going to just save that, and I'm going to republish it. Now, as that is publishing, I'm also going to switch over to do the other part of this, which is you've got to configure the Azure App Service that you are using so that it actually listens to the logs. The way you do that is in diagnostic logs. And this is a fairly vanilla. There's my publication working. So this is a fairly vanilla one. So I've got all the application logging turned off. You want to log to the file system for debugging. Click on on, turn it to verbose. Click on storage, click on detailed errors, click on failed requests. So now I've got everything turned on. And then click on save. Try again in a few moments. OK, must be still starting up. And of course, it would cease to work right now. Um, there are other ways of doing this, though. So for example, if you've got the uh, Cloud Explorer, which I don't have up there, but I have it in here. Where is my Cloud Explorer? There we go. So my Cloud Explorer is going to log in, and it's going to show all my web apps. So I can actually come into my ahall.net conf one. And I can click on log files, refresh properties. There we go. Come on. I can actually view the log files right from here. So where's my output? There we go. So I'm now connected to the log streaming service. So I am now viewing, within Visual Studio, I am viewing the logs from the Azure Logs. So let's see if I can turn these on again now. Nope, doesn't look like it's going to. Yep. I'll try this again. There's the diagnostic logs on verbose storage. Oh, that's why. File system. Remember file system. <laughs> Click on Save. There we go. That's what was wrong. I was if you choose storage, you're actually going to be dumping your logs into a blob storage on an Azure storage account. So that's the difference. I uh, uh, Sorry for that. That's a mistake on my side. So make sure you choose File System in both cases and move on. And now the application logs. And you'll see that you get disconnected, but uh, you can actually um, go into the uh, Cloud Explorer again. And you can click on View Streaming Logs. And it will appear in your output window. 
So there we go. That's, that's diagnostic logs. And you can cut and paste them from here, save them, and so on. The other thing that I want to, um, I want to show off is that you can actually attach a debugger. So um, I'm going to uh, pick a, an environment. So here in my to-do item controller, I'm going to do a, um, a, a breakpoint here. So I am going to actually uh, break on this. So um, the way that I tend to do this is I use Postman. Now I mentioned that, uh, yeah, we need to go. So my, my site is going to be https slash slash ahall.net conf .azure websites .net, and my endpoint is going to be tables .to item. And I'm going to get, that's going to get all of the items, so it's going to hit that, uh, that off. I am going to go into my, um, my website, and I'm going to go ahall.net conf um, dot auth login AAD, and that's going to give me a token. And now I'm going to go to slash dot auth slash me, and that's going to give me my ID token, which is goes along through to there. Control C. Now, if I go into my um, if I go into my um, my, my Postman, there are two fields that you need to do this. The first is zumo-api-version, and that must be set to the string 2.0.0. You will get an error if you do not include that header. It allows us to distinguish between people that are using the older mobile services v1 stuff from the v2 stuff. The other one is the xzumo auth, and that contains your authentication token. So I'm just going to cut and paste that in. Now I can click on Send. Authorization has been denied, and you can see I'm getting 401 here, so I can I can see the uh, item. So let me just go back into here. Did I miss something? The other thing I can do is I can hit, I can go into the developer tools and go over to resources, and there will be a cookie. And there's my app, app service auth session, and it is wrong. Oh, come on. Huh. I can't copy that. There we go, copy. Um, let's try that. And if I, oh, I'm still getting on unauthorized. Um, I'm going to have to have a, a look at that uh, uh, afterwards. So, um, strange. This is what you get for live coding, I guess. Da -da 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 -da. Well, one of the things that I can do is I can actually take a look at the logs now. So let me go into the output, and you can see my application there. I cannot read this string. It is a very, very long string. Well, let's see if that works. Okay, so. What we can actually do is we can compile the uh, site and get the token that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back to my Solution Explorer. And let's go down to the UWP. And let's live on the wild side and rebuild the application. Make sure it works. I am da -da -da lb. Dot Interesting. <laughs> so let's see if we can sort this out. So 
I need to add that. There's all sorts of things when you're doing live coding, let's just say. That. And let's try to sort this out. What did I do? So I did I login provider back up here, Azure App Service. Let's uh, rebuild that one. Nope. I login provider. I'm sure it's here somewhere. Public space, yep. That uses all of that. And then Azure App Service should use this. Ah, live coding. It never works the way you want it to do. So that should be a login provider, login async. Ah. Nope. Ah, that's why. <laughs> you, you see it eventually. Um, I actually passed in the, uh, I called it with the mobile service client, and I wasn't passing the mobile service client in. So let's try and run that. Let's go to, here are all my other projects, so let's go to this one, let's deploy it. Um, that puts it in the start menu for you and registers it in on your local machine. And now let's run it. So here is my application. And I'm going to log in. And it's going to ask me for my username and password. I've already registered an account. Photo Adrian at Outlook.com. And I can type in my same password. <laughs> there we go. So we're in now, and I can now type in a new item. And click on Save. So one of the things that I wanted to see was, because this is an offline sync version, hang on. Uh, let me stop this. There is the. And we'll float that so we can make it bigger. Ah, uh, you see, I'm having a problem with SQL Lite. So, ah, uh, it looks like my, uh, my vain attempts at uh, doing uh, live coding are, uh, are uh, not. Uh, not working here. So uh, I've got some more work to do to find the uh, temporary keys and, uh, and get a, a temporary area uh, set up. So um, but let's just, uh, let's just recap the uh, troubleshooting section. So first of all, turn on Entity Framework debug logging. It's easily done in the debug context. It's an Entity Framework uh, um, uh, element that will give you the ability to put out the, um, the queries that are being used to communicate with the SQL backend in uh, the console. However, in order to capture that, you need to turn on diagnostic logging in the Azure portal. Set it to file system, not storage, file system. Um, you can also watch the logs directly from Visual Studio. You can also, if you want them in a completely separate window, if we go back to the uh, capabilities of the portal, under Tools, there is a log stream option. And you can watch your logs from here as well. So you'll see it's the same thing. You're welcome. You're connected to the log streaming service, and you can go there. Um, 
You'll also be able to attach a debugger from Visual Studio, and I didn't finish showing that off. Um, I did show the where we get to the, um, and let me just uh, kill a few windows here, where we've set the, um, the to-do item. What I didn't show is how to connect the debugger. Um, there are a couple of things to do here. So first of all, here I am in the Cloud Explorer um, for my site, so which is under Web Apps. If I right click here and I say Attach Debugger, it's first of all, it is going to deploy a new version of your back end. That version of the back end is compiled with the debug options. Um, then it's going to restart your service with the remote debugger attached, and then it's going to communicate. So that's what's happening right here. So when I run my back end now, if I hit that uh, endpoint, it's actually going to um, it's actually going to hit it uh, uh, quite easily. So what I'm going to do is once that's uh, once that's done, I'm going to take this authorize off. Authorize is what makes the authentication work. Um, so I'm going to take that off so it uh, doesn't get in the way. Um, and then I'm going to redeploy it. So here's my back end. I'm going to publish. And this time, I'm going to go to the previous section. I'm going to deploy the any CPU version of the debug. So click on Next, Publish. So you can always go backwards into that. Um, and it's going to... Uh, uh, set up a, uh, a a capability. So, um, one of the uh, one of the viewers has just said, uh, Damien, you must put client as an argument. Yeah, great. I yeah, I noticed that. Thank you. Um, uh, it's uh, the, what what Damien was saying was here in the um, in the client in the portable. I had the iLogin provider had this mobile service client. In the Azure App Service version of this, as I scroll down, I hadn't put client here. So thank you very much, Damien. We, we figured that one out. So now, now that I've got rid of the, um, uh, I've published and I've got rid of the uh, authorization, I'm going to attach the debugger again. And I'm going to use Postman again to just send that I don't need auth. I just need the, the Zumo API version. If you've got unauthenticated requests, you can just do it directly. If you, you just need this Zumo API version. So use Postman, use Fiddler, uh, something like that. And if I send the request, it's going to reach that, um, uh, that checkpoint. And I can now explore this just as if I was debugging a local ASP.NET app. So this is an ASP.NET app running in Azure being debugged locally with your Visual Studio instance. This is, this is awesomely good stuff for uh, cloud development. And you can see I've got everything here. So I know what the model state is. I know what the, um, the, the URL is and so on. Uh, and I can see here my user. So if I'm, if I'm having um, uh, problems, I can see that I've actually, I've actually got that uh, request because I've got a Windows identity and I know who it is. Um, and I can see the claims. Uh, from here. So um, I actually don't have a, a, a user because I'm not authenticated, but that, was, that would be where it is, is in this user record. And you can cast that and so on. So I'm, I'm just going to prompt you again. Um, if you have questions about uh, this whole process, please, um, please do uh, type them into the window, and uh, we will get to them. So that's attaching um, a debugger. So where do you get this code? I am going to fix the code. Um, there's there's something uh, wrong with the uh, UWP version. I was I, I made the classic mistake of trying one version and then leaving the other one alone, thinking I could fix it. But there's there's something there. Um, I am going to get the repaired code and I'm going to put it on uh, this uh, GitHub repository so you can download uh, the code for yourself. Um, the Azure Mobile Apps SDKs, both the client SDKs, and we have more than .NET. We have iOS native, Android native, Apache uh, Cordova, UWP, and the Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, et cetera, PCL versions. All of those SDKs, plus the ASP.NET SDK and the Node.js SDK, they're all open source. Um, we track them. They're in our Azure 
um, organization on GitHub. So you can look for Azure mobile apps there. Um, just type it into the search window and uh, you'll see them. Um, the other thing is, is that we track issues there as well. So you can see all the development uh, going on. We also, we're active on the, uh, on, on the Twitterverse. So uh, if you really want to uh, get a hold of us, the team as a whole is on at Azure Mobile. If you want to get hold of the Xamarin team, they are on at Xamarin HQ. And if you want to get hold of me, I'm at Fizzy in the Hall. If you want some more uh, resources, I've just finished um, on Monday 30 days of Azure Mobile Apps. Uh, this takes you through all the requirements for Azure Mobile Apps, pretty much everything that you can do. It has code samples. It has walkthroughs of uh, everything from the very basic how do you set up a local dev environment, all the way up to uh, how do you do uh, push to sync with uh, push notifications going through APNS and coming back to an Apache Cordova app. So uh, it's a it's a great um, series of, uh, uh, of blog posts there. I really enjoyed uh, uh, writing them, and they're they're up available now, and the whole index is there. And it goes back to March. Um, we have a team blog. We'll be blogging more uh, now that I've. Uh, uh, done the uh, 30 days of Zumo. I'm going to be switching over to that. So, uh, if you want more information, you want to, you have an idea for me to cover, then please let me know on the App Service blog. Uh, drop me an email. Get me, catch me on uh, Twitter. Um, if this bit was a bit too late for you, if you, you, you know, said, uh, "This is great stuff. I want to do this, but I don't know how to get started." We have a learning path, and we have them for all the clients. So it's not just ASP.NET, it's not just Xamarin, it's all the clients, all the servers. Uh, you can get that at ak.ms slash learnmobile. And finally, my biggest source of information when I was learning Xamarin was the Xamarin guides. They have sample code, um, they have uh, walkthrough guides, uh, a lot of things here. developer.xamarin.com slash guides. So it looks like I've got about 15 minutes uh, uh, left. I'm, I'm quite happy to take uh, questions, show you some more, or you can watch me code and trying to figure out the uh, UWP bug. Um, it's probably very exciting. Debugging is always the, uh, is always the exciting bit. But if there's uh, no other uh, questions, um, thank you very much for viewing this. And I hope to see you enjoy the uh, rest of the program. That was terrible. OK, good evening, everybody. This is, the, this is like an amazingly late session. Wow. I'm super impressed that you're all here. I'm super impressed that I'm here uh, at 6.30 here on, on uh, what day is it, Thursday? Thursday. So hopefully this can be the final send off for your evening. And you can go do whatever you're going to do, drink or eat or whatever after this. If you've already, who's already had a drink already tonight? Sweet, me too. OK, so it's going to be great. <laughs> this session is going to be awesome. So what are we going to talk about tonight? The, the demystification of the app development platforms on Azure. So we're going to talk through a, a lot of the different capabilities that we have, the different platform as a service offerings we have on Azure, and try and explain them in a way that makes a little bit more sense than perhaps we've explained them in the past. Uh, and so try and give you a picture of a lot of the platforms, and then go into some demos uh, and, and actually walk through some of, the, some of the newer releases. We'll do a demo of Service Fabric. We'll do a demo of Functions uh, and uh, App Service as well, and kind of walk through a few of these and sort of show you the difference between them. Just as a show of hands, how many people went to my other session? OK, great. So there is a couple of slides that will look similar to you folks who did, because um, uh, I clearly wasn't going to make two sessions. So uh, I copied a lot of slides. How many people have gone to a session on Service Fabric or Functions? OK, good. So there will be a little bit of overlap. Some of the demos are different, but we'll walk through it. So let me just get started. OK. The cloud is changing expectations. This is something we're seeing uh, across all uh, industries, across all customers, no matter big, small. The, the overall dynamic of the cloud is, is dramatically changing all customers and the way that they approach development and application deployments. And this change is really driving a lot of requirements on the platforms behind them. 
And so a good example, as we look at a lot of the different industries in the market today, we start seeing that every single company is becoming a software company or is getting pushed out by a company that has become a software company. So great example, of course, is, is the Netflix blockbuster situation, uh, uh, where the, 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 the onset of Netflix and the ability for Netflix to effectively create a new business model with the, uh, the software that they built has pushed out many of the brick and mortar based solutions that sit below them. Another good example of this, of course, is Uber and taxis. And you notice all the, all the old and, and dying pictures are black and white. That's for effect. So the, uh, uh, the pictures of taxis. Of course, the, the concept of Ubers coming in and taxis no longer being relevant uh, or at least not getting as much of that usage once that Uber capability uh, built with that software back in really, really took off. And of course, Skype and the telephone, uh, and the ability to, to effectively replace, the, I, I don't know the last time I've seen someone actually on a pay phone, um, uh, and it's, it's actually very bizarre to try and think back the last time you used a pay phone. Uh, it's, it's very uncommon at this point, um, and, and not just because of Skype cell phones, of course, as well, but the whole concept of telephones have dramatically changed thanks to all of the investments uh, and improvements that software has brought on. And so as all of these companies change, there's really this sense of if you're not moving to that next generation, if you're not moving to that next phase of software development, you're probably falling behind. And some great examples, though, of companies that have actually successfully moved or in the process of moving. So one, of course, we talked about this morning, BMW, and their futuristic car, uh, which, uh, which was super cool video. I'd love to actually get that car uh, in reality. But the, the ability for BMW to transform themselves as a company to start looking towards being actually a delivery of software versus just a delivery of cars, uh, and how that software can interact with all of their life aspects is really changing the way that they approach their entire business model. NBC as well. NBC, of course, uh, as many of you know, a broadcast company, uh, the national broadcast company. I think that's what the N stands for. And the, uh, the amount of television programming that they do, uh, the amount of money that they make on adver ad advertisements in television, but the change for them of they have to make this content available online or they will start losing to other online companies that are making it available. And this was a great example running on top of media services. They actually set the record for the amount of viewers in the last Olympics uh, to, be, uh, to be watching a single event through media streaming. And so them taking their platform forward and really thinking through that next phase. And Alaska Airlines is another great example. Uh, actually, the airline I flew to get here, uh, thinking through a lot of the way that they approach IoT and the way that they approach customer experience on the devices that they make available on their planes and how customers are using them and taking that and building an analytics pipeline around it is, again, really changing the way that they think and really approaching it from a software perspective versus just from a We Fly Planes perspective. And so that aspect of, of change can both be very good, uh, but can also be very troubling for a lot of existing companies. And we're seeing this across the board, no matter what the industry is. The great part about what we offer here at Microsoft is the developer focus that we offer. And this is something that it's not new to us. This is something, this is actually a, a logo from, I guess, the 70s or, or, or early 80s uh, for Microsoft. We've been very developer focused for a long time. This is a real picture of that original team. Uh, and so bottom left there is, is Bill. Uh, and so this has is, this is, uh, been around for a long time. I feel like this is relevant for this type of picture. So. We've been doing this for a long time. Developers has been the key focus for us for a long time, and the cloud is just another step in that process. So you may ask, great, but what are app developers really looking for today? When I show you those companies, the companies that knocked out existing companies, when I show you the companies that uh, have continued to survive by reinventing themselves, what really are developers looking for? What are you looking for? And I do sum it up pretty much in one word. I think agility, I think time to market, I think the speed at which deployments can happen and the speed at which applications can be delivered is probably the most crucial aspect of how applications and companies can reinvent themselves and move forward into the future. And so what does this actually mean? Well, you know, what is agility? It's said a lot. The press talks about it a lot. What does it actually mean? 
Well, it doesn't mean being able to run uh, this uh, type of football gambit thing. Uh, no, it, it's, it's more around the how quickly you can get your application and your code into your customer's hands. And so it's both a question of time to market, time to value, but then also it's a question of iterative speed. And as I walk through some of the capabilities that we've come out with and some of the capabilities that we're really focusing on, this is the theme that really carries through all of it. How do you get that value to market really, really fast? Right? Being able to differentiate between hours is now necessary to be able to win against your competitors. And then how do you iterate? How do you learn? The amount of times that we make mistakes, even in Azure, if you can believe that we make mistakes in Azure. No, okay. Thank you. We do make mistakes in Azure, I know. Um, the, 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 the amount of time that we could ship something, realize that was actually wrong. We, we, made, the wrong, we made the wrong choice there. Learn and reship. It's crucial to being able to continue to improve the service and the value that's offered. If you remember those original customers I listed, the Ubers of the world, the Netflix of the world, they were all wrong in their first release. They were all wrong in the way that they approached it the first time. But they iterated quickly, and they were able to learn and fix themselves. And that's super critical, and again, a key factor in how we approach the entire service uh, and how we approach all the different application solutions that we offer in Azure. And so that agility is absolutely key. It does come with two other elements, and so I will just touch upon these. Hyperscale and availability are two other key elements that come together when you're looking to build an application that can really scale to the cloud and take advantage of the cloud power. And just to give kind of a brief overview of these three, I'll just touch upon each one. One, of course, is being able to scale very, very quickly at an application level and being able to scale out very quickly and scale back in really quickly. And all of the services that we talk about today have that capability. One is also being able to scale at a container level. This is a very new concept, uh, but it is one that we're seeing pick up. The agility that's offered, the speed, the deployment, and then of course the scale capabilities that come with containers really make it very advantageous to this entire movement around being able to get fastest time to value. When your application can spin up in seconds versus minutes or hours, suddenly you can really test things quickly, learn, and iterate very, very fast. And again, you'll see a lot of these concepts today. And then, of course, this global scale. And this is really where the cloud offers a lot of unique benefit, being able to deploy across the world uh, in many, many different regions. From an availability perspective, one is, of course, resilient to infrastructure failure. All of the services today have that capability, the ability to respond to a machine dies, and the app can continue to run. In fact, the platform fixes it for you. And you'll hear us echo that throughout the day. Very important to be able to get that agility. The other one is, of course, resilient to application failure. And of course, the best example we have of that, Windows Vista. It's too soon? Oh, OK, sorry. Let's, we'll cut that in the recording. We'll cut that in the recording. OK, um, the ability to respond to application failure. You saw it today in the keynote. The keynote this morning showed a great example of the deployment of that buggy, that buggy thing that Scott Hanselman did. Um, uh, and I've been trying to tell him, stop. That's a wrong code. You shouldn't put that in there. Uh, but he did it anyway. But that ability to respond to that failure and come back, very, very critical to being able to deploy applications in the modern era. And then, as I mentioned, agility, simple tooling integration, very fast time to market, and of course, services to help. Uh, and whether it be integration with things like Twilio, Auth0, uh, GitHub, et cetera, all of these things become very critical to be able to get your simple applications moving forward and very, very easy to deploy and iterate on. OK, so across these three, very, very exciting. And the services I'm going to walk through today all span different capabilities as part of these three. So the next question is great. So what do you have? What are the choices? Uh, and, and candidly, Azure's got a ton. We have a ton of application services. And this is why we have so many services. We need a session called demystifying, uh, because there's just so many of these services. It's amazingly confusing how to go piece these things together. And so there's a lot of choice. And, and we struggled, actually, to be able to explain this choice. We've struggled in a lot of ways to be able to tell you when you should use things. We've, we've shown pictures like this which are amazingly simple for you to go take a look at and say, oh, that's what I want. It's really hard, right? I mean, this is, like a, this is basically a picture of every service we have in Azure. And it's nearly impossible to figure out what you're supposed to do with this, uh, other than perhaps put it as a screensaver. Uh, and so it really, really hard. It's a great picture, a great map of all the services we have next to useless for you to be able to pick what you want to do. 
So then we write something like this, where we draw these continuums and arrows, and, and picked things and called things SAS, and, and, and drew arrows over time to value and differentiation, uh, and tried to split up between developers and so on. And, and these are also very, very challenging. Uh, they're very challenging to understand what, again, are you supposed to do with this? Uh, when do you pick one versus the other? Uh, and, and how do you make that selection make sense? Right? And so I'm going to try a different tack today. I'm going to try a different approach to try and demystify. And my approach is going to be more pivoted on what is the app that you're building? What problem are you trying to solve? And then let me tell you what we offer to be able to solve that. And so let me start off very, very simple. So the platform splits up kind of into two categories. The lower level is infrastructure as a service. And while this is technical and, and sort of the, the actual product that we have, it does help explain a category of development that you may do, which is you need to be on the VM. Right? For one reason or another, you need to be able to go make changes to the VM, make edits, make updates. There are many applications that that is definitely the case, and it makes a lot of sense. And so we have two types of categories for that. One is the VM and scale set category, and the other is just raw containers. And this is really, really powerful, uh, lots of control. You can do whatever you want on these things. So with the VMs, you can spin up one, two, three, install things. They live on. Uh, and you can basically nurture them. Uh, if you install, let's say, a SQL server or maybe a SharePoint farm, right? And you can build your app that way. With scale sets, I'll talk about in a minute, you can scale out very, very massively. And then, of course, containers are effectively the same concept as VMs, just smaller and faster. Uh, and so raw containers, again, very much fit into this infrastructure category because they just deploy the full OS uh, uh, bundle in a single click. They're just a lot faster. Uh, and so they do kind of fit into that same category. So just to explain briefly the VM scale set and VM story, the VM story is every single VM is individualized. So if you're using VMs and you're building apps with VMs, Every VM is its own guy. So Cori VM, Cori VNet, Cori Storage, and they all live separately, and I have to go nurture them and, and love them, uh, and so on. They're, they're my pets, as it were. And then maybe I have a second one that's Mark, and it's the same sort of story, and deploys that way. Now, scale sets, which Scott mentioned this morning, is GA today. This changes the concept a little bit. It pieces all these things together as a unit, and suddenly I can scale in an automated way, and I can deploy in a very automated way. And so here you see I've got, let's say, um, uh, six scale sets here. Uh, and I can deploy them, and they just deploy. They auto scale automatically uh, as needed, and they deploy as a single unit. So one, two, three, I build my app. Let's say I build Chef on it, or I want to deploy PowerShell on it, or I want to deploy Bash Script on it. It will do that in an automated way and scale them as necessary. And so this is the core component for the infrastructure layer. We build on top of this the container service. And this is, again, building a deployment of just raw containers. And this just places this on infrastructure. And so if you're building an app with a VM, or you want to go scale out and you want to build scale sets, or you want to put it into a container and deploy very quickly, this enables very fast raw container deployments on either uh, the Mesos plus Marathon platform or the Swarm platform. And what these guys do, they really, their primary role is to orchestrate. They find a spot on a VM and they deploy. Okay? And so this really is, while you can build lots of application solutions on this, the core technology that we're offering here is sort of a simple raw container deployment. Um, and so the container service, it kind of grays the line between infrastructure and platform. It finds a home for things. But if you're building an app that's just using containers and you just need to put it somewhere, the container service is great, but it is closer to that infrastructure layer than it is in the platform layer. OK. And so that's the full IaaS layer. Now, the rest of the talk is really focused on this layer above, this layer that I call platform. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that I call platform. And it really splits up into four different types. One is if you're looking to build microservices. And I'll explain what that is and the type of scenario that that would entail. One is existing frameworks. So you're deploying, let's say, an existing .NET, an existing Java application. Maybe you're deploying web and mobile applications. Or maybe you're looking for serverless, event-driven based applications. So this breakdown, again, it's a very simple view. And the goal is to pivot the view based on what you're trying to do. And this isn't based on your full app. 
right? And I'll talk at the end about how some of these pieces can come together. You can put pieces from this and that and this and that and make a full application. But for specific portions or components of your app, what are you trying to do? Is it a web portion? Is it a mobile portion? Then you've got the service for you. And so this is how I'm going to try and describe it. And we'll walk through these demos with that context in mind. So let me explain to you what I mean. So the four different components, serverless, web, mobile, microservices, and existing frameworks. So serverless, this was Azure Functions, as the example mentioned this morning. This is really geared towards event-driven compute. So it's where your application components are trying to respond to some event, uh, whether it be an IoT-based event. Maybe it's a gaming event. Maybe it's a phone or mobile event. Maybe it's actually an event in another microservice platform. The whole idea is it's event-driven, it is serverless, which means you are not managing any of the infrastructure here. All you're managing is this snippet of code, and you're saying, based on an event, I want to run that. And this is really a category that's, that's starting to really blossom as a great supporting category across the rest of the advanced services that we have. So pretty much every other service that we have, you probably can find a way to make it better with this serverless capability. The next is web and mobile. It's kind of obvious. You're building a web and mobile app. You want to build a, a fully managed solution, no infrastructure management, maybe an e-commerce site, maybe an LOB app, maybe supporting websites. All of these are really, really great to go build. Um, and of course, they're one of the more common apps. They actually the most common services and applications built on Azure today are focused on web and mobile apps. The third is microservices. This is its own category of application. And I'll go into a lot of detail later. But microservices, if you are looking to build a massively scalable, 24 by 7 available, yet highly agile, multi-component application, microservices is going to be the place for you. Now, microservices is not the answer for everything you're building. It, there are a lot of things that don't fit into that category. Uh, and you, you want to be a little bit careful, or at least very choosy, about when you build microservices, because it will be costly. Right? It's going to take work. You're going to have to think through your app in a different way. But microservices, when done right, things like that multiplayer massive universe game that we showed this morning. Uh, we've seen folks use it for queuing systems, uh, very massive complex queuing systems on top of storage or actually using the storage as part of microservices. Or large, large sites, very complex solutions. Uh, this is where microservices can be very powerful. Um, and so it is really geared towards those types of applications and can be great when used correctly. And then existing frameworks. This is really when you're, you're designing your app geared towards a specific language or runtime that you'd prefer to use. So if you're, if you're building your app, you're like, I'm a Java guy, and I just, I just love Java, and I'm going to use Java. Or I'm a .NET guy, and I love .NET, I'm going to use .NET. Uh, and, and, uh, but I want to get on the VM a little bit, and I want to be able to configure things a little bit my way. This is where this existing framework model makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I'll give you some examples of those as we walk through. And so this could be maybe an existing enterprise app, an LLB app. Uh, maybe you're doing a new scale-out solution, but with some existing components that are tied into the underlying system. And so these are sort of the four big, when I talk with customers and we walk through what your app going to look like, these are, end up being the four big platform requirements that we see. And you'll see at the end, I'll put these pieces together to show you applications that span all these different components with a single all-up solution or service. And so for Azure, the services that we offer, once you break it down into this category, it's actually quite easy to be able to subdivide our services. Serverless, of course, is Azure Functions, which we talked about this morning. That is in preview today. Web and mobile. Uh, app service is absolutely the solution. And this enables very fast web, mobile, and of course, API apps tied in with that entire solution space. With microservices, Service Fabric is the answer. And uh, we'll show a little bit of that today. And then, of course, existing frameworks. The solution we have today is cloud services. This is a perfect example of a .NET-based existing solution uh, to be able to deploy some VM-native code, uh, but being able to deploy in a PaaS-like environment. And so across these four, very, very powerful stuff. Now, we have partner solutions that also complement this stuff. And I'll talk about that in the very, very end, uh, that, that you can say, great, existing frameworks. Well, what about Java? You said we have a .NET solution. Do we have a Java? So we do. Right? We have a lot of partnerships on the Java side, whether it be, let's say, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, whether it be OpenShift. Uh, and so we do have that wide range as well. But I'm focusing today mostly on the Microsoft services and the capabilities therein. And these four do perfectly align with those four scenarios that we see customers trying to deploy. OK, let me actually dig in here. 
So cloud services. I'm just going to touch upon cloud services. It's the oldest service we've got. Uh, and so it's been around for a while. But the overall story here is cloud services offers uh, platform as a service, but with VM control. Right? And it gives you the ability to go in, modify the virtual machine. It's a simple .NET runtime. It's a very simple experience. Uh, and it gives you really just the, just the tipping point of PaaS. Uh, you're still on the VM. You still have to install your apps. But it does some things like health and discovery. It can do automatic updates. And probably the most valuable aspect of cloud services is it does do OS patching. That's really when you sit down and say, well, why do you use cloud services? It's almost always because, well, I have to install something on the VM, so I can't use your other services. I've got existing applications or an existing solution, uh, but I love your OS patching, so I'm going to use cloud services. That is almost always the answer we hear for cloud services, and it's super good at that. That is exactly what it's good for, uh, and, and it continues to be good for that. Um, and so a lot of the advanced services we've got, we talk about later today, um, they end up not giving that full VM control, and that's sort of where they start changing uh, as you move up. But cloud services still gives that existing framework control, and that's a, that's a big value add there. OK, <clears throat> so let me talk about Service Fabric. So Service Fabric, this is a microservice-based platform. And so let me just spend a minute on what, what this thing is. What are microservices? So when you split up and look at microservices, they're effectively taking these concepts of massive, monolithic, three-tier solutions, or multi-tier solutions, excuse me, and splitting them up into subcomponents. And it's, it's really important to understand why that's interesting. So historically, you were making an update, let's say, to your business logic. Let's say you were making an update to your order management portion of your application you historically would have to go test the entire business logic component. You'd have to make sure everything about it was, uh, was working perfectly, that there was no hidden dependencies on the changes you made. Right? You'd need that whole team to be in the office to go test it before you deploy. You probably needed the other two teams, too, to make sure that all the interaction didn't break, because who knows what sort of dependencies there were across that whole thing. It made the entire system amazingly non-agile. Right? And especially as you looked at scale and highly available solutions, very, very challenging to make that work. So what the value of this microservice model is it makes these components individually built and deployed. So now I can go update the order management tool and know that nothing else is going to change. Everything else is going to remain the same. I don't need the usage guys to come in or the reporting guys to come in. I just need the order management guys to come in to go make that change. I can iterate really fast. Again, remembering back to that agility point, iterate fast and get your fast time to market. This allows you to do that. And that's really one of the benefits. And of course, this enables that, those small independently executing components to continue to have that health and that independent health model continue to, to, to remain in place. So if something fails, it can respond to just that subcomponent. To make that work, of course, you need all of these microservices to have published API calls between them. So every one of the microservices, when they talk to other microservices, they need to have a published API that can be uh, fully validated and tested. It's a really hard part about building a good microservice platform. So this should not be overlooked. It is, again, one of the challenges. It's also when you do this right, you get those benefits in an amazingly, amazing dividends. Because suddenly, you can make updates to that order management and know nothing else will break. But until you have those API constructs, uh, it's very, very hard. And of course, this also makes everything very loosely coupled and fine-grained. So you can make these updates very simple uh, and very agile. <coughs> and so this platform. The, the platform that runs these needs to have a few aspects, a few characteristics that we view. One is lifecycle management, being able to do updates and rollbacks, being able to support a highly scalable infrastructure, being able to run in a hybrid way. We actually think running on multiple clouds is a requirement for a good microservice platform. And of course, having that high availability and being very cost efficient, being able to use your resources very, very well. So we do believe pretty strongly service fabric fits this, this demand and many, and many more requirements. It allows you to manage these microservices at scale. It integrates with your CI CD pipeline and your Visual Studio tooling. It gives that 24 by 7 availability. In fact, we run so many of our services in Azure on top of Service Fabric, uh, DocDB as an example, uh, Cortana as an example. All of these are running on top of Service Fabric. One key thing, stateful services. Uh, Scott Hanselman talked about it this morning in the keynote. This is a really valuable aspect of Service Fabric. You can put your state right next to your compute. It gives you very, very high performance. 
It also automates the replication requirements of that state. So if you want three copies, four copies, five copies, the platform will take care of it for you. An instance dies, it will automatically fix that replication state and re-replicate back out. So this is why things like SQL DB actually use uh, Service Fabric for its underlying system. For containers and Docker, so today the Linux version of Service Fabric does support Docker and does support containers. The Windows version will support this as Windows Server 2016 makes its way out the door with container service brought with it. So we do expect to have Docker containers supported across this entire platform. Uh, the one key thing that I like to call about for containers and, and, uh, uh, and the aspects and relationship between containers and microservices, I do believe that all microservices will end up being containers, mm -hmm. but all containers are not microservices. Right? You can put anything you want into a container. You can put a full SharePoint farm conceivably into a container and deploy it on a box. Right? That's clearly not a microservice. So uh, I do think that we will see that almost all microservices will move to this model, but this model, the uh, Docker and container model, is not equivalent to a microservice. And then multi-cloud. This is something we also announced today. You can deploy this on-prem. You can deploy this in Amazon. Uh, you can deploy this in GCP if you want to. Uh, and that is a really cool aspect of Azure Service Fabric. So I've talked a ton, probably way too much. Let me actually do a quick demo of the Service Fabric story. OK. So what I've got here, I've got um, a, a, an actual an application running here in Visual Studio. And what I'm walking through right here, this is actually fairly similar to one of our walkthroughs that we have. So you can go walk through this yourself um, and play around with it. Uh, but this is the visual objects. Who here has played with visual objects on Service Fabric before? Oh, cool. OK, one. Sorry. This is going to be boring for you. All right, so visual objects. So what I'm going to do first, actually, so I've got this application. I've downloaded it. You can see um, I've basically got a few services over here. Um, uh, and this is based, building a ton upon the actor model. And what the actor model is basically a simplified programming model in Service Fabric to make the concepts of, act, of, uh, of microservices easier to comprehend. It's effectively the object-oriented approach to microservices. So each actor is its own microservice and then basically builds out contracts with everyone it's going to talk to. So I've got an object, an actor object, that is a stateful object. And these are, they're called visual objects. And they're basically little, little guys that dance around the screen. Um, and they bounce around. And they leave a little tail behind them. And that tail is the state uh, of, that, of that object. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to start off pretty simple and do a publish here. I'm actually going to show you the local publish. OK. And so it just very quickly deploys and launches here. And so this actually launches on a local uh, deployment of Service Fabric. Now, what's cool about Service Fabric, this is not an emulator or a simulator. This is the actual code running on my box, similar to running it on-prem, running it in another cloud. It's the exact code. The only thing that slows me down here is my machine's power. right? And so that, obviously, you'd want to put it on multiple machines as you started growing these things out. But this is just running my code on the box. And so here you can see I've got local host set up here. Um, and, and you can see here I've got, from an application perspective, let's actually go back up to the cluster, I've got two applications and five nodes. And these five nodes are actually simulated nodes, uh, but, the, but the actual code here, the, the service fabric code itself is not. And so I can click on this, and you can see I've got basically the objects for this visual object uh, deployed. Um, and so here you can see the actors uh, are deployed. And so there's, two, uh, there's a, a few of these actors deployed down here. And I can see sort of the state that's, that's been used here. And so let me actually see if this is up and running. OK, let me go localhost. OK. And so there it looks like it has deployed. And so this is what this guy looks like. OK. And so these guys are the visual objects. Each one of these is an actor. And it's down, dancing around. And it's basically got its dis, uh, location. And its movement patterns are defined by the app. And its little tail is the state that's saved as part of that actor object. OK. So I want to deploy this in the cloud, though. But look, I don't want to go spend the time or the money to go spin up multiple nodes. So one thing that you should definitely take a look at, party clusters. These are things that we've come up with to make it really easy for you to deploy in the public cloud. So you can go to one of these party clusters and basically say, look, I want to go play with this. It gives you access to a five node. These are five virtual machines, very large, deployed in the cloud to deploy your application. Now, this is shared. So there could be many people on that deploying. That's why they're called parties. 
Um, and so they are shared environments, but they, you don't have to pay for them. You put in your email address, you put in basically that you're, you know, prove that you're not a, hu that you're not a machine here, and so I can go here and put in my email address and prove that I'm not a robot. Okay, and, oh, that's my email address. You guys are all gonna email me now. Good, that's fine, I don't read it. Oh, I'm already in one, uh, okay, I already set up my cluster. So you can join this, it'll send you an email. That email looks something like this. And it gives you basically the address of this cluster and now you can deploy whatever service fabric solution you want. So let me actually go in and deploy. I've got one set up here, so <clears throat> publish. And I will go to cloud.xml. So here you can see I've got party 41. And that's the, the port for service fabric. So I will publish here. And so this should just publish and get me going here in the public cloud, running on top of Azure. And so let me pull up the service. And the exact same service fabric explorer. This is a key point. Same service fabric explorer, the one I had local, the one I have here. It's deployed as part of the app, which means you deployed in Amazon. You'll see the same service fabric explorer. That's part of the benefit of doing this. And so here you can see, oh, look, it's unknown. So it looks like it's deploying. Or I did something wrong. Oh, good. OK. I didn't do something wrong. Oh, maybe I did. Oh, yeah, just deleted it, and now it's deploying the new one. Okay, and so this should end up deploying uh, effectively that same model. Okay, great, should be there. Let's see if it's up and running. Looks like it's upgrading here. Let me try and load it again. And so you can see from that Visual Studio experience, I'm just picking the endpoint. So even from Visual Studio, the same tooling will work no matter what environment I'm deploying to. OK. Let's see if it, let's see if it came up. OK. So there it is. Let's see, did, did it actually, are my guys spinning? Still it's still updating. OK, thank you. So. <clears throat> The key thing here is the ability to go deploy in multiple locations, deploy in that local environment, deploying in the public cloud. Now I can do updates as well, and you saw one this morning. As that update rolls out, you can see it, of course, in that local environment and know exactly what's going to happen. You can update just the actor um, and be able to deploy. And so just to quickly show you what that looks like, here I've got some code. And right now, these objects are not moving. They are, they are actually keeping steady and just, they're, they're not spinning. They're actually moving on a straight line. In this case, if I make this change and I go and edit the manifest version, I just want to make sure that only that code that I've updated gets edited. So I'll put two here, okay? And that allows me to control which microservice gets updated. And then I'll do upgrade application. This will actually go in and it will upgrade. Okay, so there they are spinning. And so this will go in and it will actually upgrade them and start spinning them uh, update domain by update domain. Okay, and so again, the benefit of this, I'm only updating that actor, right? I'm only updating it one by one or by, by update domain by update domain, so it's 20% walking through. Um, and it's updating nothing else. So the website itself remains up even while the update's happening. If something fails, there's no problem. It can roll back. Um, all of these aspects, again, the huge benefit of the microservice platform and the huge benefit that Service Fabric offers to be able to enable that at massive scale. So you can imagine this type of app deploying at very, very massive scale and being able to have that control and capability. And so here you can see we've got some updates that are actually happening right now. And so there's the upgrade right there. Let me zoom in here, okay? And so go to the details and you can see sort of the upgrading story right there. And so if I sh go over to the site, I don't know if anyone's actually been updated yet, uh, but as these guys get updated, they will start rotating instead of just going straight. I don't know why it's so, so jumpy. I think the Wi-Fi here is, is uh, troubling me. So that update will progress. So I'm actually gonna come back here and, uh, and, go, and go back here to the deck and uh, and uh, uh, walk through sort of the rest. So that is sort of that model around microservices. Again, it does take work to get there, but if you're deploying that type of app, very, very powerful. So I do like to take just one minute and explain this part of the platform, which is this microservices stacking. So the scale sets at the bottom, right? This is the way that the platform sits. Both the Azure Container Service and Service Fabric sit on top of scale sets. 
we do have two different approaches to building these types of applications. As I mentioned, our container service, very composable. You can put anything you want on that. It's, it's really in your hands to deploy exactly the solution, the application you're looking for. Service Fabric is much more prescriptive. This is the big difference between these two. The container service, whatever you want. Applications, they're pre-built. You can use the Mesos-based, uh, the Marathon-based solutions. You can put all types of uh, pre-built applications on it and build your own microservice platform as part of it. Service Fabric, it's all sort of built in, right? And so it's got that prescriptive nature, which also means it's not replaceable. It's not composable. You end up using the platform as it's been built, which has both really good positives, but also can have some negatives. And so again, it comes down to what is the app you're looking to build. Both of these are very, very powerful and again, unique for us to have both of these in the same place. Okay, so let me move up the stack. App service. So app service, you've heard plenty about app service. Uh, and, and it's a fantastic service, again, focusing on a lot of that customer-facing web mobile API solution. And so building a, a great web and mobile app with app service, the combination of these solutions, web apps, mobile apps, logic apps, and API apps comes together in this single billing model as part of the Azure app service. And so the real benefit here, and uh, Nir is going to come up and show it here in a slide, is a bunch of these capabilities automatically handled for you. So you're building a web solution. Everything's handled for you in a lot of automated ways. So automatic patching. You don't have to worry about any of that OS patching. It's all taken care of for you. Autoscale is taken care of for you. You actually don't even need to think about that you're running on VMs. It actually doesn't matter, right? As you build these mobile web apps, uh, you just don't care. Uh, you're building the app based on the solution, the code that you're writing, and all of that's taken care of for you. It can integrate with SaaS-based solutions and can integrate and deploy into on-prem environments as well. Um, and so very, very exciting capabilities. And of course, that agility point, coming back to that from before, this continuous integration with tools like VSTS, GitHub, Bitbucket, and more, you can now get this deployment running very, very quickly. You can respond to changes and get them deployed live almost instantaneously. And to show you this, I've got my good friend Nir, and I'm not going to say his last name, and he's going to come up and give a quick demo of this. Yes, thank you. Can thank you, you switch Nir. the machine? Oh, yeah, I'll yeah. switch the machine. Oh, thank you. So we've had, uh, well, I'll try to log in. Uh, we've had app service for about four years before we launched in preview. So how many people did use app service in the room? All right, so uh, a few of you. Uh, so we'll go to the first demo real quick so we can have time for functions, which uh, is brand new and has some new scenarios. Uh, but like Corey was saying, the focus here is on agility, and the focus here is on practical things web developers need to do. And when we started up service, the whole goal was to say, I have a web app. It's running on IIS on the local web server. I just want to take it to the cloud. And as the service grew in the last four years, uh, we've seen more scenarios like APIs and mobile and so on. Uh, so this first one is I have an existing website. Uh, it's running some uh, Node.js code. And I'm already integrated with GitHub. So to save time, I did not create the website and create the integration. Uh, but you'll believe me that it's there. There's a webhook that uh, connects GitHub to uh, my GitHub repository to this website or web application. Um, here's some history about the last deployment. And we can go ahead and browse to this uh, site. And <coughs> hey, hello, app service. And then I can go to GitHub and uh, make a quick change. So it's late. I'm sure we want to get to the next stage of, uh, uh, of cocktails here. And at this point, <laughs> what will, will start happening is we're going to start seeing the new deployment. Uh, again, very simple demo, but uh, the main point here is, is great. I can have uh, my team develop against uh, uh, GitHub. I can use different branches. And the code that gets uh, uh, pushed into production uh, does that automatically. And we can see this new deployment, uh, I believe, is already done. Uh, so I can go back and browse to my site and uh, uh, hopefully see this change. Uh, again, very simple. That's kind of the 101 demo that we always do. Uh, but the capability is very powerful. Works with GitHub, local Git, VSTS, and so on. Um, the second demo is a very simple case that uh, we all had to do. Uh, all of us have been developing um, locally uh, using Visual Studio. And in some cases, we have our local development environment. We have our local 
uh, settings to our connect, connect to our database, uh, for example. Uh, so in this case, I have uh, my super easy, cheesy uh, web application. Uh, it takes uh, custom setting from web.config, my slot. The value is local uh, locally, and I'm going to debug it on this machine. And when I push it to the cloud, obviously I don't want to push this web.config with uh, my secret and, and see it all over the place uh, in production and break my application. So there's obviously a risk with this agility. I can push something to production and uh, break it very easy. So we're running on local. Uh, with app service, we have this feature for app setting uh, that basically allows us to say, uh, let me go configure something uh, on the back end. Uh, this travels with the application, the application settings. And those settings win uh, in production. So as we can see, we have this uh, my slot and the value is pod. Uh, it's marked as a slot setting because, again, for uh, <coughs> brevity, we didn't go into the next demo uh, where I can create these pre-deployment slots and, and uh, a pre-production environment. Uh, so in this case, as I browse to this website, uh, we can see that we're in pod and the app version is two. And to uh, finish, again, uh, showing you how easy it is to um, go ahead and, and push to Azure. Let's say we want to go up to version three now. And we'll go ahead and do a publish. We should probably stop debugging. And we have this very deep integration, just like we've seen with Service uh, Fabric uh, between App Service and uh, Azure. Sorry, between Visual Studio and Azure. And at this point, uh, we're pushing using Web Deploy and we're pushing the new bits. It knows that's only one file and it should be happening pretty quickly. And we're loading this thing and it's uh, free and uh, we can see that we're in pod. Uh, so very quick taste of uh, app service. Um, all of these capabilities and uh, like you've seen in the management portal, uh, there's a huge le uh, uh, list of capabilities and features and uh, settings that you can drive are based on this being around for four years and listening to our customers and understanding what they need uh, practically to run and manage their applications. Thanks. Great. Move Thanks, Nair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can stay nearby. OK. And so the last, the very top uh, section of those four sections that I originally started with is Azure Functions. And this is something that, again, was announced today in preview. Mm -hmm. A very exciting capability. It is event-driven technology. And so the idea here is you've got a little bit of code, okay? You've got a, say, a function even uh, of code. Um, and you've got some event, some data that's coming in, some action that's happened. And again, I, I like to think of this as sort of like a, a, a fairy dust that sits on top of the platform. It integrates with everything. So any event that happens, you want to run some code on top of that, bring them together, and you've got our Azure Functions capability. And so with Azure Functions, very, very powerful stuff. You can take this and apply it to any event. So drop an image in storage and take an action. Uh, go through an event hub endpoint and take an action. Uh, write the code that you want in the way that you want it. Right? And so uh, capabilities to deploy both C Sharp, uh, JavaScript, and of course deploy executables across a wide variety of different languages. It is deeply integrated. The things that you just saw from Near, it is deeply integrated in the DevOps story, that end-to-end -end Visual Studio in integration, which you'll see here in a minute. And again, of course, pay for what you use down to these functional components as part of that overall app service plan. So really, really powerful stuff. And of course, as we announced this morning, open source capabilities to run this anywhere you want. And so some awesome stuff. And again, I'm going to ask Nir to come up. And so we're doing a little dance to do an Azure Functions uh, demo and focus on some of the cool things there. Cool. Thanks again. Um, let's see. You're on. Oh, I have a meeting. I'm sorry, I have to. Oh, you have to go? Yeah. All sorry. right, well. All right, you do the demo. OK, cool. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you have an Azure function based on that meeting request? or? <laughs> That's coming. Uh, cool, so uh, Azure Functions, uh, one of the important points to, uh, to mention, it's based on our uh, Web Jobs SDK. Uh, Web Jobs is a feature that we had for, uh, we announced actually in uh, uh, January 2014, so it's been around for a while. And the goal there was to essentially have use the same value that we've seen before of the continuous integration, easy to deploy, uh, deep integra integration with Visual Studio uh, to allow us to do some background processing, uh, kind of the canonical scenario of uh, 
someone uploading an image or creating a transaction, putting the transaction on the queue uh, on your front end, and then uh, processing it <coughs> on the back end. I guess Ibiza is really wants me to do something. Hi. Cool. Um, as we moved forward, we've gotten all this feedback from our customers saying, hey, uh, we'd really like this thing to be more of a first class. And we did this push in the last uh, uh, kind of three months uh, to get it out as a first class service uh, that we announced today. So one hand, it's brand new, but uh, we have some high confidence in the, in the back end. It's been open source from day one. And it will remain open source moving forward, and we'll have some processes allowing the community to contribute and accepting uh, community-based connectors and so on. Uh, so let's get started. So we have this new page uh, that became available today on Azure.com. Uh, if I hit this button, uh, I'm going to go to this page. Uh, this page just allows me to get uh, started very quickly, assuming I have an Azure account. A version that uh, does not require an Azure account is coming quickly. Um, and in this case, I have two uh, function uh, containers or function apps. Um, the interesting thing here is that one of them runs on a traditional hosting plan. It runs on a reserved <coughs> VM or reserved instance, which is just like uh, what we know and love with Azure App Service, meaning if you already have uh, stuff in Azure App Service, you're already paying for the compute. You can run your functions there, and nothing will change in how much you pay. Uh, if you want to try our new stuff, which we call dynamic hosting plans, those are paper execution, uh, and you can create them here. Uh, so we'll start by looking at my uh, dynamic hosting plan one. Uh, so this is, uh, it says dynamic function, that's cool. And right now it's empty, and we'll walk through kind of creating the first uh, canonical uh, set of scenarios. This is where I talk about how the Wi-Fi sucks and so on. Oh, okay. great. Um, so we have some uh, kind of a tutorial to get people started. The initial case is, hey, I have an event-driven thing, but the event is someone is calling my uh, endpoint. It's a web API or a webhook. So I'll go ahead and uh, click Create. And we try to create this uh, uh, tutorial. And it's all our fault. The design team had nothing to do with this UX. So we'll take all full responsibility. Uh, this code is in Node.js, and I'll show it in a moment. Um, the interesting thing is our integrate tab. Uh, we have three concepts in function. One is triggers. Those are the events uh, that will launch your code. And then we have bindings. We have input bindings and output bindings. Input bindings are essentially data sources that are available to the function. And we'll show some of that. Input binding can also be a trigger. So for example, the best uh, example of that would be a, a queue. The queue has uh, messages that are being given into it, and those uh, messages will uh, then be available to the code as an input binding. Output binding is where I send uh, data out. Let's go through this real quick. These are the function app settings. I can set my memory size, and I can access some of the functionality that lives in the underlying app service uh, application that is under this. So let's skip the tool and, and start coding. Uh, so again, very simple thing. This is a, a Node.js endpoint. I can see my logs, and I can go ahead and just call it. So interestingly enough, I'll get this 400 error, and that's actually by design because I did not put a, a name on, uh, on my query string. The query string, uh, the request object is becoming a first-class object. The function uh, framework is giving it to me as an object, so I have to go back and, buy, uh, and basically put a name here. Oh. The other guy is, uh, yeah, the other guy is already a parameter. And we get this. Uh, this, by the way, was, um, is an API key, which I can also roll, so I can use this as a web API. So if I go back to my function, my log will tell me that this thing ran, even if unsuccessfully a couple of times. And then I can go and say, you know, let me make a real quick change here. Hit save, refresh, and we'll see the change. So a very simple endpoint. Uh, if some of you know this competition that we don't talk about, 
20 less clicks to get this going than those, you know, river in uh, the safari people. Uh, but we don't, it's not like we're counting. Um, so let's take another example. Let's say we want to run something every five seconds. And there's a reason. Uh, we'll pick C sharp. <coughs> this would be a timer trigger uh, in C sharp. Another language does not exist in the other, in South Lake Union. I'll stop with that, sorry. Yeah. So now we have this thing running and it's going to basically just run every five seconds. So that's not really that interesting. Uh, but let's say that we really want to take this data and maybe we're processing something in an input binding and send it to a storage queue. So I'll go to my integrate tab, I'll add a new output and we support many uh, different things, and if we have time, we'll show DocDB, for example, and we'll select Azure Storage Queue. And we're going to select which storage queue in my subscription I want to use, and hit the Save button. At this point, my queue becomes a parameter that is known to my code. Uh, because we're using the... Um, Web jobs SDK under the hood, all I have to do here is I can say out string my queue, and then I can just do this. And you know, that's it, that's going to be written to the queue. Oh, but obviously you noticed I screwed up uh, and I didn't put the ampersand or the whatever this character is called and the compiler caught it <laughs> and this thing didn't work. Your mic is on. <laughs> okay, so let me fix my, uh, my code here. We compiled it, now we're happy. And if we're going to go look at our trusty um, Azure storage Explorer for Shinizo, where is it? And we're already seeing this queue uh, getting filled with uh, my messages here. So every five seconds, this thing will go in. So again, very simple, it's running every five seconds. Uh, we're working on a better monitoring story uh, but we already, this will come in and become part of the browser thing, uh, but I can already see this in, in our live event stream, so I can see this thing going every five seconds. Uh, those things are very inexpensive, so we don't even get, uh, the system still thinks they're taking zero milliseconds each, so we're not seeing the average time. Uh, so again, very simple uh, way to get started. So that's all very nice, but uh, it's not really useful. Um, so let's look at a couple of functions that uh, I've prepared in advance, and we'll go to my uh, classic app. This run, runs on a, on a dedicated uh, classic app service, and we look at just one of them. And this is essentially a webhook. So uh, we create, we have, since webhooks are patterns, uh, we have a generic webhook template. And what it does, it accepts a, a JSON body, right? So uh, I can hit uh, the run button here to test, and we're seeing this result. If I looked into my integrate tab here, uh, our output is into Azure Table Storage. Uh, so I'll go back to uh, the Storage Explorer, and we can see the test uh, for hello build. So again, that's very nice. Uh, I have essentially a web API that allows me to go into a first party table like Azure Tables, a uh, first party service, uh, but I really need to be able to uh, call it from a web page. So I have this, again, uh, very cheesy web page, not here. Sorry, very uh, cheesy web page I wrote uh, that calls this uh, from kind of XML HTTP from the client. Uh, this is not going to work uh, because I have to um, configure calls for it, right? So um, I need to go ahead and tell um, and tell the web page that will call it that it's uh, allowed for it to, to call this, this web service or webhook. Uh, so if I look at my function app se settings, because I'm running on app service, I can go ahead and configure that uh, 
this website is allowed to call this, this Azure function. Uh, so now I have this live, I have this uh, web page that you've seen, and we can say, um, try again, I guess. It's always a good thing to do. And we've just written this to the Azure table. And going back to uh, my coding window, we should have seen some of these uh, activities in my logging. Um, so I think I have some more, but I think I'm running out of time. So back yeah. to you. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, dear. Mm -hmm. Nice job. All right. <laughs> yes, let's give them a round. Great demos. So the last few minutes that I, I wanted to spend up here was, was really sort of talking about now that I've walked through those four big scenarios and really six when you include the IaaS portions below, uh, there really is this concept of putting it all together um, and sort of what this means as you're deploying applications. And some very simple examples to be able to put this all together, uh, obviously taking components like we walked through already, uh, being able to run a, a web app uh, using parts of our Active Directory and SQL database and build a very, very simple solution as part of these components. Of course, scaling that out to a multi-region solution and suddenly you're doing things like traffic manager and bringing in that app service using solutions like Redis cache and SQL. These are things that we didn't talk too much about today, but they put together these components of multi-region web app deployment and make it very easy for you to get this massive scale solution using some of the very simple things that Nir showed you as part of that web app model. Now imagine if you wanted to also keep track of some sort of events that were coming out of these websites. As Nir showed you, those events, maybe they're dropping into something like Event Hub with functions sitting on top. And then it takes an action and takes that, whatever, maybe someone hits a button and that takes an event and then does some other action. These pieces coming together as part of this application model become very, very powerful to take this multi-region uh, web application and being able to use the function story integrated with that web app story to create a single application model. Now imagine you want to put more of that web model together. You want to use mobile apps. You want to use the API service. Uh, maybe you want to do notification hubs to get those events down to the phone. And maybe you're putting some things into table storage. Again, Nir showed you how to perhaps use functions on top of table storage to be able to take action and maybe send something off to your mobile device. So someone makes an order for flowers, maybe you want to send something off to the delivery guy that's got the phone, function takes that action, pieces it together, perhaps sends that, that delivery address off to the phone, and that's the different part of the app that's built. So you can imagine, you can see how these things would come together. An actual real life example, TalkTalk Talk, uh, in, in the UK, who's got a, a video story. They've effectively taken Service Fabric, uh, they've built solutions using uh, the uh, web app model and the API app, uh, and they built Service Fabric as part of a queuing system that sits on top of storage. And so this actually does a queuing system integrates with other services like Media Service to go do encoding of these applications, and Service Fabric handles all of that queuing state. And again, you can see how these components fit together as part of this All Up app. And the last one here that I'll show you is an e-commerce site. So a massive e-commerce site starting with web app, and this is pretty close to one that's actually running on Azure. Starting with web app, using Azure Event Hub for any sort of content or orders that may come through using service fabric on top of table storage for any sort of systems of record, purchases that are happening so that they're very, very fast on the stateful service fabric and table storage ends up being that backend replication uh, just in case and so for some more regional coverage. Maybe then you wanna use functions on that and do an API app based on, again, delivery or based sending information out to uh, an order site that then you can build additional apps on top of uh, using API app. Maybe you're using Redis for the shopping cart as people are walk, working on top of the, app, uh, 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 the Azure web app and maybe SQL DB with ML to be able to track trends or the way people use your site. All of this comes together to be able to build your entire solution, your entire site uh, that you may want to deploy on top of Azure. And so you can see how these components, they help each other, they help support each other, and they serve different purposes and different, and different goals. But when they all come together, you can suddenly build some pretty amazing things. 
So the last thing I'll end with you on is we talked all session about just Microsoft products. I want to leave and make sure you know that we don't just support Microsoft products. We do have some great platform offerings from partners as well. And I'm not going to spend any time on them right now. Uh, but these are great solutions if you're looking for Java solutions, um, if you're looking for other platform offerings. Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, Kubernetes, Elastic, and Apprender are all able to run and run great on top of Azure. And so that we are big supporters of these partner solutions too. But today's focus was, of course, on the Azure specific platform offerings. So with that, I want to thank you guys. Again, the focus, choice, and agility. Go build those apps. Go enjoy those services. And again, please tell us how we did today. So thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the build.